Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 29th Annual Hum Music Colloquium. I'm your host and moderator, Emmanuel Kim, the Korea Foundation and Kim Renault Associate Professor of Korean Literature and Culture Studies in the Department of East Asian Languages and Literatures. Established in 1995, the Hum Muzu Colloquium is one of the oldest and most significant academic outreach programs at the George Washington University. This annual meeting provides a forum for discussion of Korean humanities on the arts, history, language, literature, thought, and religious systems that shape all areas of Korean studies in the context of East Asia and the world. As the pandemic continues to affect many people around the world, GW has made a commitment to provide a safe and healthy environment for all of our presenters and audience members. We hope that you understand our having this year's colloquium online once again. However, the silver lining to having the colloquium online is that we attract attendees from all over the world, which allows such talks to attract us to reach a broader and more diverse groups of people whom we could not have imagined to reach otherwise. We hope that you will join us in person for next year's HMS Colloquium, which, which will be co-hosted by GW's Textile Museum, examining the history of fashion and the fashion industry from the Joseon period to the present Korean wave. This year, I'm particularly delighted to moderate one of the most important facets of the Korean wave. Korean literature translation. The colloquium today is called Global Enterprise of Translation, Translators, Institution, and the Market for Korean Literature. And I hope you will gain a whole new perspective on the translation industry and appreciate the arduous task of translating and the enormous effort to have Korean literature reach the global readership. We have invited some of the key players in the translation world today who have shaped and are continuing to shape the literary field to make Korean literature more visible, accessible, and impactful to the global market. Before I turn to our translators, I would like to acknowledge our sponsors who have provided so much support to make today's event happen. First and foremost, I would like to thank Professor Emeritus Yonggi Kim Renault for establishing this forum to expand the Korean studies field. As the daughter of Han Musuk, you have certainly honored her legacy. And by extension, I strongly believe your legacy, uh, I, I believe your legacy for doing so will continue. I would also like to thank my department, the East Asian Languages and Literatures, the GW Institute for Korean Studies, or what we call GWIX, the Korea Foundation, of course, and the Literature Translation of Korea, Institute of Korea, sorry for their enthusiastic support for this year's colloquium. Now, I would like to turn it over to Director of GWIX, Professor Jisoo Kim, for her opening remarks. Jisoo? Hey, uh, thank you, Emmanuel, for that uh, kind of introduction, and also inviting me to give my remarks at this year's Hamusu Colloquium, along with other distinguished speakers, Professor Younggi Kim Runo and the President of LTI Korea, Kwak Hyo Hwan. I'm also excited to be part of this colloquium with our speakers today who are the leading translators of Korean literature. Kudos to Emmanuel for his excellent job in inviting our six speakers this year. I know how hard he's worked to prepare for this colloquium. Uh, this year's colloquium is already the 29th, which means it has been organized for the last 29 years at GW. This is the longest existing Korean humanities colloquium in the world. In explaining the significance of the colloquium, Professor Kim Runal obviously is the best person to explain since she's the founder of this colloquium and had organized it until the 21st colloquium since um, before she retired. I had the honor of succeeding her role and have been organizing it until last year from the 22nd to the 28th. So it's been almost 30 years that this colloquium has been organized at GW. We cover so many themes in the field of history, literature, film, culture, politics, anthropology, religion, philosophy, and so on. For many years, this colloquium was the only conference that offered the discussion of Korean humanities in Washington, where most talks were focused on, or focused on the security concerns. And so this colloquium has played an important role in educating the Washington community beyond security issues on the Korean uh, Peninsula. So the Institute of Korean Studies uh, builds upon uh, uh, this, the mission of uh, the Hamusu Colloquium in diversifying Korean, uh, uh, re Korean related issues in Washington area. 
So as many of you know, this colloquium was named after a renowned female writer and a mother of Professor Kim Woon-ho, Han Moo-suk. So as you can imagine, there are several colloquia on Korean literature already. In discussing Korean literature, however, this year's topic distinguishes from the previous colloquia by focusing on the issue of translation and covering the growth of its industry. It will cover the global growth of Korean literary production, but at the same time, discuss some challenges that we face today. So I would like to thank once again uh, to our speakers, especially translators joining us from Seoul, which is very late, late at night there. Uh, and especially even late, um, uh, by the time that we finish this colloquium. So uh, thanks once again to our speakers for making this year's colloquium possible. I very much look forward to our discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Jizu. Uh, for those who received the latest news and upcoming events from GWICS, we thank you for attending the innumerable amount of talks and conferences we host. For those who are unaware of the activities at GWICS, please visit the link and I'll put it in the chat box and you'll see the amount of work GWIC does to promote Korea and expand the field. Now, I would like to turn it over to the new director of LTI Korea, Kwak Hyo Hwan. 안녕하십니까. 한국문학 번역원장 Kwak Hyo Hwan입니다. 올해로 29회를 맞는 한모습 콜로키움 개최를 진심으로 축하드립니다. 그리고 이 한국학 연구와 교류 행사가 미국의 명문 조지 워싱턴 대학에서 20년이 넘게 지속되어 오고 있다는 놀라운 사실에 한국 문단의 한 사람으로서 경의를 표합니다. 널리 알려져 있듯이 소설가 한무석 선생님은 한국 전쟁 이후 실존과 허무주의가 주류를 이루던 문단의 여성, 인습, 구원, 사랑과 죄악, 인간성 등의 보편적인 주제에 천착하며 한국문학의 외연을 확장하고 풍성하게 하셨습니다. 또한 넓은 품으로 후배 문인과 문단 사람들을 감싸고 살뜰히 보살핀 어른으로 알려져 있습니다. 작고하신 후에는 한모습 문학상을 통해 뛰어난 후배 문인들을 시상함으로써 선생의 뜻이 이어지고 있습니다. 뿐만 아니라 한국의 근대 문학사에 큰 족적을 남긴 작가의 유지가 한국 내에 머무르지 않고 국민 연구자들 간의 소통의 장으로 이어지고 있어 매우 기쁘게 생각합니다. 멀리 미국에서 20여 년간 이 행사들을 이어오신 조지 워싱턴 대학의 김영기 명예 교수님과 임마누엘 김 교수님의 노고에 깊이 감사드립니다. 올해 한모습 콜로키움은 한국문학 번역의 세계적 도약에 대한 논의를 한다고 들었습니다. 한국문학 번역원은 세계 곳곳에서 한국 문학이 자유롭게 읽히고 소통하고 교감되도록 하기 위해 설립되었습니다. 지난 25년간 한국 문학의 번역 출간, 국제 교류, 홍보, 번역가 양성을 위해 지속적으로 노력해 왔으며 그 결과로 한국 문학 작품 1615종이 40개 언어권에서 출간되어 해외 독자들과 만나게 되었습니다. 또한 한국문학 번역 아카데미를 통해서는 7개 언어권 1153명의 신진 번역가들을 배출하였습니다. 근래 들어서는 한류 붐의 힘입어 K-POP과 K-MOVIE에서 더 나아가 k l i t e r a t u r e 라는 말이 생겨났고 한강, 이승우, 김원수, 편혜영, 황선미, 김혜순 등의 다양한 스펙트럼의 한국 작가들이 해외의 독자들의 사랑을 받고 있습니다. 하지만 아직까지 한국 문학이 교감하는 통로는 좁고 해야 할일 또한 많이 남아 있습니다. 특히 미국에서 한국 문학을 연구하시고 가르치시는 연구자분들과 오늘 행사에 참여하시는 문학 전문 번역가 분들께서 그 통로를 넓힐 수 있는 열쇠를 쥐고 계시다고 생각합니다. 오늘 행사에서 작게는 한국 문학의 해외 진출을 위한 출판사, 번역가, 지원기관의 역할부터 크게는 한국과 미국 문학 교류의 미래에 이르기까지 폭넓은 대화가 오고 갈 것으로 기대합니다. 한국문학 번역원은 여러 연구자와 번역가 분들의 의견을 경청하고 한국문학의 해외 진출을 위한 새로운 변화와 전기를 마련하도록 더 열심히 노력하겠습니다. <목소리>
다시 한번 제29회 한무숲 콜로키움 개최를 축하드리며 이 뜻깊은 자리를 준비하신 관계자 선생님들의 노고에 깊은 경의를 표합니다. 감사합니다. Thank you very much, Director Kwok. It is unfortunate not to have you here in person, but we hope that once the pandemic is done and traveling is much safer, you'll be able to visit the nation's capital. Finally, it is an honor to present Professor Emeritus Yonggi Kim Renaud for her introductory remarks on this year's colloquium. Yonggi? Good morning, or good evening, or good day, friends all over the world. I'm very happy to be here. Before I make my remarks, I want to express my sadness at the passing yesterday of Professor Gary Ledger, an esteemed colleague of mine, a teacher, a great translator, and one of the pioneering giants of Korean studies. He's dearly missed, but his legacy will live on for generations to come. I'm most honored and humbled to deliver an opening address for the 29th Hanmus Colloquium, departing from my usual role of a convener of the meeting. Lest I should run out of time, I want to make sure to convey our debt of gratitude, although everybody has already mentioned the four key entities that have been pillars of support for this now well-established academic outreach program of George Washington University. The Department of East Asian Languages and Literatures and the Institute for Korean Studies and our constant sponsors, the Literature Translation Institute Korea and Korea, Korea Foundation. We are blessed to have a solid pool of conveners for this colloquium series to continue, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> this valuable institution. I'm most appreciative of the efforts made by the current chief convener of the colloquium, Professor Emmanuel Kim, not only an acclaimed translator and scholar of Korean literature himself, but also an energetic and keen administrator of academic and outreach programs, who has brought together a remarkable pool of experts to deliver their thoughts on translation of Korean literature from a wider angle than usual. I thank our new program assistant, Kim S. Talk, program manager Sean Dolan also for their meticulous handling of this and other activities by the Institute. My thanks must go above, uh, above everything else to all the presenters and the audience for which this colloquium series has come to be known. Many of you might have noticed that this is the second time the colloquium is meeting to discuss translation. Just comparing the titles of the two colloquia, Creation and Recreation, Modern, Kore Modern Korean Fiction and its translation of the sixth colloquium held in 1999, and today's topic, the global enterprise of translation, translators, institution, and market for Korean literature today, we can see how in just 20 years, the concept, goal, and scope of Korean translation have evolved like so many other domains of Korean studies. The previous colloquium was an academic discussion of what translation means to different people and how it is done. Today, the focus is on translators who are absent in most discussions on translation, except when talking about their mistranslations and the comic and harmful consequences. Translation is no longer an individual struggle, 
It is an enterprise involving many different contributors. Translators are barely visible or entirely invisible, even from the covers of the very publications that owe their existence to them. Yet, Natalie Kelly and Justin Zetcher's book, Found in Translation, How Language Shapes Our Lives and Transforms the World, and many other works show the endless ways the translation has impacted the world. Every human being is a translator, or communicating is an act of translation. Translation feeds the basic need of humans to connect with others, to inform, to feed their curiosity, and to understand, improve upon themselves and others. It is the bridge that gives vitality to life itself. Human beings share many common qualities. However, they are also complex individuals, each carrying their own history and creativity. Translation is therefore by force interpretation. And it is above all the translator's prerogative that is reflected in any translation. The role of a translator thus cannot be overestimated. Everyone knows that the HMS Colloquium is not a forum about the author Han Musuk, although it was established in her honor to uphold her spirit of openness curiosity and education. However, talking about her today is relevant for the history of translation of Hamusuk's works illustrates the broader history of translation of Korean literature. And I'm more familiar with her experience than with any other writers. Now, who are the translators of Hamusuk's works, then how did they get to translate them? I personally know many of the translators of Hamusuk's works, either through meeting them or reading about them. It is noteworthy that almost all of them are scholars and good English writers themselves, regardless of their specific expertise or profession. For example, the very first published translator of Han Musuk's work, A Halo Around the Moon, Warun, the original title, written in 1955, published by the International Pen Club Korea Branch in 1961, was Ju Yo a famous novelist, poet, scholar of English literature, trained at Stanford University and president of the Korean Translation Association. I cannot help noticing now though, which I didn't before for some reason, that in the earlier days, there was not a single woman translator of Han Musuk's works. And there are many, aside from me, although the author was a woman. And there was only one native speaker of English among the translators. Otherwise, they were all Korean males who translated her works into English. In those days, most translators were invited to do the translation. I, I don't think anyone just translated the work they liked and approached the publisher with a finished version. This, by the way, is the best method anyway, according to Edith Grossman, a former translator of Spanish literature. It seems that women and foreigners were not asked to do the job due to wrong assumptions about them. Korean literature in translation was rarely 
but sometimes included in world anthologies through a proper process by an editor abroad. Richard Roth's translation of Han Musuk's Shadow, original title Punul, was included along with Kim Dae-yeon's translation of Oyoung-soo's Seaside Village, Cat Maul, as a representative work of the Republic of Korea in an anthology with 18 short stories titled Asian and Pacific Short Stories, compiled by the Cultural and Social Center Asia Pacific Council and published by Charles Tuttle. Uh, in 1974. But they were not the first case though. Dong Song Kim's translation of Han Musuk's sister, Han Malsuk's short story, Flood, original title, Jangma, was selected to represent <laughs> Korean literature among 34 stories of the world in an anthology titled The Language of Love, edited by Michael Rita Martin, and published by Bantam Books in New York in 1964. What made Han Musuk an internationally recognized writer, however, are two of her most significant works that have been translated into English and published by two prestigious university press, presses, Encounter, original title Mannam by the Universal Press in 1992, and Enso Flow's History, Yaksan and by the University of Hawaii Press, in, published in 2005. Encounter was the first contemporary Korean novel to be published by a major academic press. Another history was made here as both translators of these books were women. Also, these two books have received critical acclaim and more commentaries in highly respected international scholarly publications and journals and media than any other Korean writers in translation until they were published. The processes through which these two books got to be translated were quite different one from the other though. Oh Gyeong Kim Chang, who translated Encounter into a foreign language for the first time, did not choose to do so initially. The task was a kind of bonus gift for having one in the previous year a major new translator award from Korean Literature and Arts Foundation, Munejinuan, which used to be the main funder of translation projects. I chose myself to translate Enso Flo's history because I loved it as a piece of literature, but also because as a person in Korean studies, I firmly believed that it was the kind of book that would be extremely helpful to explain Korean culture and civilization and to show the recent history of Korea that continues to impact the life of Koreans and people of the world and to showcase Korean aesthetic. Since both novels were considered not really fit for a popular press, the finished manuscripts were submitted to university presses. However, publishing any translated work, not just Korean translation, in the US and UK is an extremely difficult matter. Translations of any kind, only account for 3% of the books published in the English speaking world each year, according to Brother Anthony. But then how did Encounter and Soul History succeed 
in overcoming so many stumbling blocks and finally get published by these two very scrutinizing publishing houses. Two earlier failed attempts at publication in Korea made it almost impossible to have encounter published in the US especially when the American publishers were already reluctant to publish translations, and especially works from such an unknown place like Korea. However, however we found a highly professional acquisition editor who appreciated the work and became the novel's advocate with excellent peer reviews, one of them even comparing the novel to the work of Herman Melville and Leo Tolstoy, finally, the opportunity opened. And so flows history, experienced different hurdles, but finally the University of Hawaii Press accepted to publish it. In this case also, the relationship I had established with the press, with the publication of another book, which was not a literary work, helped me reach the right person. When the favorable anonymous reviews arrived, the road was cleared once again. In both cases, I sort of played the role of a literary agent providing all the details and responding to the questions the press is asked, adding extra information that could be helpful for their decisions. Other translators, I'm sure, have played a similar role in getting their work published. That both novels received so many positive critical com commentaries in major publications is a very unusually fortunate turn in the history of Korean literature in translation. It matters who publishes a literary piece. More recently, the House of Pomegranate Trees, Songyu Namajiyagi, co-translated by Che Jin Young and Susan Newton, was published as ebook by LTI Korea in 2016. I know that Che is an experienced translator, but I have no information on Newton. I think they applied for a translation grant from LTI Korea, as I remember signing the permission to translate the work to Ms. Che. I cannot elaborate on the impact of this online publication, however, as there is practically no comment on it. Although it has now been five years since its appearance online. The only thing loud and clear is that there is no comparison between publishing with reputable international publishing, publishing houses especially in an academic one, and this mode of internet publication, especially by a Korean institution, even when issued by such a respectable entity as LTI Korean. The translations of HMS novels in English were followed by others in different languages, including French, Polish, Estonian, Czech, and Chinese. I suspect more languages will be added to the list as, as uh, time goes by. Of these are the foreign language versions. The only one I can read is French, and therefore I cannot comment on any aspect of these publications other than the fact that all the translators also seem to be quite established scholars and writers, and that these books were all published by reputable uh, publishers, including universities, university presses in, in respective countries. 
almost all these translations seem to have received financial support from the LTI Korea. Another fact to, no to note is that compared to the English translations, almost all the European language translations are done by native speakers of the target or arrival languages. In, these, in the case of Chinese translation, there were agents involved, one in Korea and the other in China. Hiring agents looks like a new development in translation enterprise involving literary translation. And an increasing number of foreign agents seem to be approaching Korean authors trying to establish mutually beneficial relationships. Here, the French translation of Mannam <coughs> encounter translated as a rencontre uh, by Philippe Thiebo deserves a special mention, not only because it is a beautiful work of art as a literary piece, which is both faithful to the original and remarkably revelatory to the French readers, but also because the circumstances under which it has come into being are rather extraordinary. I met Professor Thiebo, who was a scholar of Asian philosophy trained in Sangyongban University, totally by chance as a Korean studies at a Korean studies conference held at the Academy of Korean Studies in Seoul. This was a happy encounter that led to building an attractive bridge between the Koreans and the French, really the East and the West. It was through his translation of Mannam that Thiebo built an important relationship with Paul Ricoeur, who is one of the major philosophers of the 20th century. Ricoeur not only read the manuscript, but enthusiastically recommended the publication of Manam Rencontre. Later on, Thiebo's literary, cultural, and philosophical analysis of Manna presented during the 2008 HMS Colloquium, celebrating her 80th birthday of Han Musu, <clears throat> is a moving testimony to his deep knowledge of both French and Korean cultures and civilizations that made his jewel-like translation possible. Once the translation received the blessing of Paul Ricoeur, finding a French publisher must have been a lot easier than initially feared. Han Musu and the Korean literary world were fortunate indeed that someone so eminently qualified fell in love with her work and applied his impressive writing skills in his, in his native language to translating it. Outside this remarkable French case, I had not seen any serious reviews of the other European language translations, which is certainly different from the two English publications, which have received numerous positive reviews. This apparent lack of local language reviews could change with time and seems to indicate, but it seems to indicate that we should pay more systematic attention to what happens once the translations are published. The ROK government, especially to the LTI Korea, and two private foundations, the Sun and International Communication Foundations. Their efforts to induce, introduce Korean literature to the world have contributed directly to the explosion of Korean literature on the global stage. <clears throat> 
the sheer number of publications since the creation of these three entities is something never even dreamed about even a few decades ago. The activities of the, L of the LTI Korea are especially far reaching. Their publications are beautiful in content and form. Their projects are varied and always cutting edge, forward looking and impressively well organized and wide ranging from building an internal library open to outsiders, to supporting actual translation, to training future translators and promoting high quality work. LTI Korea is also trying to encourage dialogue between Koreans and foreigners, writers and publishers and their mediators to the conferences where people playing different roles in the business of making translation possible meet. They make Korean literature accessible to the deep and wide, wide world of readers who cannot read Korean. Lately, the situation is a lot more favorable for Korean authors to be introduced to the world through translation. First, Korea is, uh, is better appreciated thanks to its improved standing on the international arena in all aspects of life. The expansion of the country's soft power, often called the K-wave, or Korean way or K culture is visible across various popular forms of art and customs, be it music, dance, drama, food, fashion, and finally literature. It is wonderful that Korean literature and translation is now getting published by major publishers and popular presses getting awards and even commercially viable. Not only the number and, and the linguistic range of translations, but also diversity and freedom with which the writers express themselves are phenomenal. One main reason is that Koreans feel much more comfortable with themselves and with others as they have become more secure and less parochial. And their creativity is vibrant. This is something to celebrate as it helps the Korean economy, boost the Korean people's morale. Uh, but it does not mean we should forget that literature should provide intellectual and aesthetic pleasure as Brother Anthony eloquently stated two decades ago in a talk given in an international conference. Building a true Korean canon through international acceptance of Korean literary work for, a, for Korean literature is for a longer haul. It may be a tall order to fill in today's world culture, yet it is worth pursuing. Thank you very much for your attention. And I wish you uh, all a very happy discussion and meeting as usual in all the numbers of colloquium scenes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Yonggi. We appreciate all the work that you've done to translate your mother's works of fiction and to establish this colloquium. Okay, we will now begin our colloquium with presentations from our translators. Each will have about 15 to 20 minutes. And after we are done with the first panel, we will have a Q&A session. During this session, I invite our audience members to type their questions in the Q&A box only, please and I will do my best to get through all of them. I'm thrilled to introduce our speakers today. I will read through each uh, person's bio for the first panel. 
and they will go in that order. So after each translator is done with their uh, presentation, uh, the next person could just uh, continue. The first translator is Jamie Chang. Jamie Chang is a lecturer at the Graduate School of Translation and Interpretation at Iwa University, uh, Women's University and the Translation Academy at LTI Korea. She has translated The Great Soul of Siberia by Suyong Park and Kim Ji Young Born 1982 by Cho Namju. Sora Kim Russell is a literary scholar translator based in Seoul. Her recent publications include Pyeongyang's The Law of Lines, Hwang Sekyung's At Dusk, and Kum Eunsoo's The Plotters. She has taught literary translation at the Bread Loaf Translators Conference, LTI Korea, and Iwa Universe, uh, Women's University. Anton Herr is a literary uh, translator based in Seoul. He is a graduate of the Korea University College of Law and Seoul National University Graduate School and was awarded the title of Person of, of Distinguished Service to the state in 2002 after serving in the Korean army. His translations include Sang Yong Park's Love in the Big City, Bora Chung's Cursed Bunny, and Ocean Vong's Night Sky with Exit Wounds. Sophie Bowman is a PhD student in the East Asian Studies Department at the University of Toronto. Her translations include Kim bo -young's I'm Waiting for You and On My Way to You in I'm Waiting for You and Other Stories. Juna's The Second Nanny, published in Clark's World. Pekina's picture book, Magic Candies. And Looking Back, Life Was Beautiful by Grandpa Chan and Grandma Maria. Please welcome me, uh, or sorry, welcome our four translators. And I hope we have a very fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Jamie. Hello, everyone. Um, so I would like, it is a great pleasure to be here. And I would like to thank uh, GOX for giving me the good time slot. So um, I have the sleep schedule of a nine-year-old, which means it's now about two and a half hours past my bedtime. My hands are shaking. So thank you for letting me go first. Translating feels as if I am entering a world someone else created and letting the characters speak through me. The character's thoughts and feelings enter my head in Korean, gets processed and experienced as fully and without bias as possible, and comes out in English. If there's something I can't fully understand or see clearly, I study the text over and over until I get it. In the first 10 years of my translating career, when I was taking all and any work that came my way to pay off my monumental student loans, I often came across racist, sexist, elitist protagonists that represented the viewpoint of the story itself. For lack of a better term and more sophisticated insight, yucky is how I would describe what it felt like to have these characters speak through me. As a translator, I feel I must walk in the shoes of my characters to the best of my ability, even when the shoes are disgusting. It's not my place to judge, but it's still painful. Translating can be painful for the opposite reason as well, when the story hits too close to home. A character who is undergoing hardship, whether it's a slap across the face or the death of a spouse, I feel it secondhand as a reader. But as a translator, I feel it in much greater detail. And then there's a third cause of translation pain that comes from a complicated relationship with the character. Kim ji was one of those characters for me. When I read Kim ji for the first time, it read like an anthropological study of every woman enduring everyday misogynistic microaggressions that lead to an extreme case of postpartum depression and psychosis. 
When I read it for the second time, it read like the narrative of a hardworking but passive individual called Kim ji Young, whose lifetime of unvoiced opinions and unexpressed anger culminates in a mental breakdown. When I read it for the third and final time before I started translating, I saw it as a third person patient report embedded in a first person narrative of a male psychiatrist whose misogynistic projections are censoring and coloring the accounts of a woman suffering from psychosis as a result of simply existing in a misogynistic society where the odds are never in her favor. Seeing Kim ji held up as the poster woman for female oppression in Korea, I could almost hear the less fortunate women minimizing and dismissing Kim ji suffering as whining, and the more empowered women, women blaming Kim ji for being passive. In a story published in April 2020 called Oki by Cho nam um, a feminist novelist, Cho wa Yun discusses her runaway success and her old high school literature teacher, Miss Kim, contacting her out of the blue with a lecture invitation at a university. The novel wasn't awfully progressive or radical, but it landed in the crosshairs of so many disputes. A middle-aged male actor read it, recommended it, and was heralded as a feminist while a young female radio show host who introduced the book on her show had to post a statement on social media and then turn the account private when the attacks continued. I have to admit this increased circulation in sales, which gave rise to more disputes, more sales, and even more disputes in a cycle, vicious and or beneficial. I was being published and I was given a voice. I believed there was strength in the written word and that there were certain things I ought to write with a sense of duty. I was afraid, lonely, and disappointed more often than not, but I kept reading, thinking, asking questions, and leaving records whenever I could. But hostility was more powerful than hospitality. Things I never said were printed in double quotes in writer interviews and sentences and scenes that were not in my novel came up in online reviews. In the end, I gave in. I'm being used. The thought I'd been desperately keeping at bay came over me and in that moment I knew I'd been broken. I took a wrong turn in my Hans Christian Andersen red shoes. My feet danced a happy jig as I wept copious tears. I had but one goal, get out of these shoes. I accepted the Yeonju University lecture at a time when I was declining all commissions and favors. The lecture was announced on the Yeonju University website and Facebook page. And the first comment was, Odara Tijara, hope you die on the way here. I was afraid of getting knifed on stage. I got on the Mugunga train to Yeonju and I vowed I would never give another lecture ever again. As the story continues, Cho Yun and Miss Kim catch up after the lecture. They share a deep, meaningful conversation that brings back memories for Choa of her family history. She writes the story, and when it is published, she gets a call from Miss Kim. Miss Kim called in the middle of the night. We hadn't been in touch since the lecture. How could you take my personal history and pilfer it for a story like that? I open up to you about the most painful part of my life and you go and do this? What are you talking about? The story you published in Litter, that's my story. Uh, no, it's not. It was the same, it was exactly the same. She claimed that I divided the incompetent and violent part of her father into two to create the father and brother characters in my story that I changed the part where Miss Kim's father slapped her mother in the hospital to the brother character slapping the girl at their father's funeral, that the brother going through the girl's bag and checking how much she had in her purse was exactly what Miss Kim's father did to her, and the girl freezing every time she was subject to violence was exactly like her as well. Miss Kim, there are so many women out there who have experienced violence at the hands of their brothers and fathers. Absolutely no one deserves this, but it's honestly quite common. Quite common? Is that what this is to you? 
you want for nothing growing up. You live comfortably as an adult. And now you think the women struggling way down on the bottom are just so fascinating. Trot them out and make sweeping claims about how common and widespread the experiences are. The lives of women are all different and we're all each suffering in our own way. Does that even occur to you or your readers? Why would you think people don't know that? You're not the only one who gets it. Many women told me their stories after lectures at libraries, before interviews, at book signings, at the bookstore, and in the brief moments here and there. Not to seek an answer or advice, but because they just spilled out of them. See the tip of my thumb here? I lost it when I was working at the factory. My mother's raising my kid. I don't know if that was the right decision. I reported a Me Too incident and many others. We thanked each other. Thank you for writing this book. Thank you for reading. Thank you for speaking up. Thank you for coming. We exchanged words that were hard to say out loud. And in that moment, we sincerely meant it. In the end, I couldn't tell Miss Kim that the story was based on my life. It felt too much like whining. I have the right to speak, to write, to express my thoughts and feelings. Who decides who has the right anyway? I didn't want to defend myself to Miss Kim or anyone else, including myself. Simply, I was so tired of it all. I hung up on Miss Kim. The tension between the universal and the individual brings the differences and similarities in the individual experiences into sharp focus. Many people pushed back against um, Kim Jiang as the universal every woman, each comparing and contrasting their suffering against hers. And maybe in that process, the individual Kim Ji Young trapped in the male psychiatrist's first person narrative might have been forgotten. The greatest challenge in translating Kim Ji Young for me was trying to hear Kim Ji Young's voice through the layer of the psychiatrist's censorship. This turned out to be an exquisite vein because it was as if I was looking through Kim Ji Young through a frosted glass door. As a translator, I had to try to see Kim Ji Young through the psychiatrist's filter in order to be faithful to the story and its objective, clinical, self congratulatory perspective. But as a reader and person, I wanted Kim Ji Young to speak a little louder and take a step closer to the glass door so I could hear her over the psychiatrist's overwhelming man's editing. And then I wondered what would be the real life equivalent of opening that frosted glass door and meeting Kim ji in person? After such a long history of oppression, is it even possible for women to meet other women without patriarchal bias getting in the way? In my opinion, Chunam just greatest strength lies in the fact that she looks at things squarely in the face and examines them with such fearlessness. Translating her two most recent novels, Kim Ji Young, born in 1982, and Saha Mansion, was like taking a trip down bad memory lane, where so many of the horrors that happened in the last 40 years of Korean history has come back to dislodge something in us. In Saha Mansion, the English translation of which is coming out next year, the atrocities are represented in beautiful symbols of resistance that for those who lived through the collective trauma of Sewa and the death of protester Peng Namgi um, will recognize. In many interviews following Kim ji and Saha Mansion, Chunam Ji has often said that she wrote these books as a means of preserving a record of the times to let posterity know how the average Korean woman born in 1982 lived, how quickly a person's reality could turn inconceivably awful. 
I don't know how Tonamju will be received by posterity decades from now, but translating Tonamju in the present is like trailing behind Antigone through the battlefield of recent Korean past in search of collective traumas still waiting for proper burials. Whether it's microaggression or violent oppression or even passive aggressions, what I find amazing about Chunamju is her refusal to look away from the problem or lose hope or smooth things over with pretty lies. As a huge fan of repression, avoidance, and quitting, I don't know how she does it. At the end of her story, that said, the character Cho Ayun writes a letter to Miss Kim. I start an email with the subject line, Dear Miss Kim, I write, I'm sorry. I'm ashamed I hung up on her like that. Most of the story was based on my own experience and that while it is true we share similar experiences, it does not mean we are the same people. And while we are not the same people, the conversations we had that night did bring back memories of my past experience. And so she wasn't wrong to call and complain. I write that I was able to get through my senior year, a time of helplessness and exhaustion, of humiliation at my own inadequacy, of mother making me seaweed soup on the morning of my college entrance exam with the words, we don't have money to send you to college too. Thanks to Miss Kim and the Un Young book, Bird's Gift, she lent me. I write, I am alive today, thanks to her. I tell her I was too bogged down in my own suffering to see less fortunate girls around me with bigger problems. And I am ashamed of that, that I don't know why I have to feel so ashamed, that I resent her, that I'm sorry, and I'm grateful, that I miss her, that I hope we meet again someday, but that I don't want to see her, and I hope we never meet again, but that I'll miss her, and that we will meet again in the end. Thank you. Jamie, thank you so much. Um, now we will move on to Sora. Hi. <laughs> um, that was awesome. Well, thank you so much for inviting uh, me to speak here today. Um, yes, it's a bit late here, but I will <laughs> try to uh, keep my energy up. Um, so I was wrestling quite a bit actually with what to talk about uh, for this colloquial, colloquium and I ended up deciding uh, in lieu of talking about a specific translation to talk a bit about my personal experience of becoming a translator and uh, certain things or tendencies that I've observed over the years. Uh, and what I decided to focus on was the tendency that I've observed, which is uh, the tendency to reduce everything related to the translation of Korean literature to these very stark binary categories like literal versus liberal, sparse versus detailed, east versus west, native Korean speaker versus native English speaker. It's not unique to Korean translation, of course. Um, much smarter people than me have done really great jobs of confronting this binary, but it keeps resurfacing in old and new ways. Um, for instance, it comes up in reviews of translations uh, when we see reviewers trying to guess whether the translator has stayed very close to the original or strayed from it, as if the only way to translate a literary text is to choose one direction, literal or loose, and to stick to that approach on every single word of the translation. Or we see it too when a translator's ethnic or national origins are treated as a shorthand for how they translate. Quite often, it seems to be believed to be right there in our names. A Western name means you must have been more creative, freer with your translation, whereas an Asian name means a robotically accurate but robotically unlyrical translation. On the other side of things, it, it can become a site for resistance. The more Korean the translation, the less colonized, the less plundered. Binaries have their uses, I suppose, but it's limited when it comes to describing what translators really do on the page and who we translators are. The binary is also something that I've battled intimately during my own journey through translation. As a mixed race Korean American who translates her mother's tongue into her mother tongue, I found myself getting shuffled back and forth, but never transcending, never exploding the binary. When I first started out, 
uh, in translation, I found myself put into the too foreign to understand Korean feelings box. And I pushed back by trying to assert my own Koreanness um, to push the, to, because like it or not, mixed people are part of Korea and the diaspora. So in Korea, for example, I would insist on being addressed as Kim Sora and not Sora Kim Russell with my mother's family name preceding mine as if it would somehow shield me. I'm sure that it made no impact at all on how others perceived me or mixed Koreans in general, but I thought that it would give me a way to respond to naysayers. I could translate from Korean because I am Korean was my handy but flawed argument. When I was on the verge of debuting as a published translator, a fellow Korean American translator quietly asked me, are we making a mistake by publishing under our Korean names? I knew what he meant, but I was naively hopeful that having a hyphenated family name would serve as a shorthand for my bio. And I wasn't about to resort to passing just to avoid being misread. But as he warned, some of the early reviews of my work focused on the fluency of my English. One evaluation described me as almost at the level of a native speaker. A book blogger I met in person demanded to know what I did to ensure the quality of my English, that I work with an American editor who was helping me. And just like that, I had to jump to the other side of the binary to defend myself. I could translate into English because I'm American, was my handy but flawed argument. At other times, I've tried taking a different tack by insisting that good translation is good writing and isn't about blood or nativity at all. But as the writer Matthew Salas argues in his book, Craft in the Real World, what is considered good writing is a matter of who's reading it. Or to put it another way, there's no pure unracialized realm where we can go and find some entirely neutral standard for well-written or well-translated prose. The binary rests heavily on a notion of purity. We imagine that there is such a thing as a pure, unadulterated Korean reader, someone who has perhaps never left the country or been exposed to too much foreign culture and can understand any piece of Korean literature on a deeper than subconscious, a genetic level. The book has already written itself inside of them without them having to have read it. This person is then best suited to judge a translation for how accurately it has reproduced not only that work of fiction, but the work of the nation itself. It's easy to poke fun at the idea, but the same assumption arises when a Western reviewer judges a translator for being too Korean to possibly write well in English, or a critic for being too Korean to possibly understand what sells well in English. That is, they're assuming that English too is in the blood, and that someone from this part of the world cannot ever acquire enough English to meet those standards, let alone be able to change the standards. 15 years ago, when I first started out in translation, there was a lot of emphasis in Korea on keeping native Korean speakers involved in the process, either as editors or as co-translators. My understanding is that a great number of existing translations had been reviewed and found to contain an unacceptable number of mistranslations. Um, and in some cases, it appeared as if the translator simply tossed out the author's voice and adapted rather than translated their works. Later, when Korean translations began appearing on bestseller lists and winning major awards outside of Korea, this approach was upended in a standard evaluation team of one native Korean speaker plus one native English speaker was replaced by a single non-Korean speaking evaluator. Opinions flew back and forth about how translation should be conducted and critiqued. Was it more important to preserve as much of the source text possible or to create a target text that would appeal to the foreign reader, even if it changed a great deal of the original? Because of course, there couldn't possibly be a way to satisfy both or do something else entirely. A 2018 Guardian article critiquing critiques of Korean translations praised only white translators and claimed that, quote, Korean literature's historic problem has been professional translators nearly always translating into their second language who have throttled the literary life out of it, unquote. It was difficult back then to find any awareness of the diversity that already existed among translators of Korean literature, let alone a nuanced understanding of our personal relationships to the languages we were working with. You can only be this or that, or go this way or that way. Every now and then you might see a hopeful take that diasporic Koreans, having been born outside of Korea or immigrated early enough, would rise up and take the wheel. But this largely ignored those diaspora and third culture translators who had already, already been publishing their work. Um, translations produced within Korea, as well as translation critiques produced within Korea, were viewed with suspicion, as if by virtue of coming from here, they couldn't possibly be worth reading. And when something produced here did do well or does do well, you can be sure that someone will claim it was a top-down victory, a government-engineered project, rather than an individual success. 
So entrenched still is the Orientalist assumption that Asians aren't capable of independent creative work, that successes and failures alike tend to be attributed to committees, corporations, the government, anyone but an artist and their chosen support team. I was teaching literary translation when articles like the one in The Guardian that I quoted came out. More than once at the time, I had students ask me if they really had any shot at all. One said she wondered what the point of even studying translation was, if all that mattered was appealing to white readers slash consumers, and if the only way to do that was to be white themselves, then were their careers doomed before they even graduated? They should have been celebrating the fact that best-selling translations were proof that Korean stories can be loved and embraced outside of Korea, when instead they were being told that they did not belong and would never belong. Like a piece of pottery being kept safe in a far-flung museum, Korean books would be better off outside of Korea, away from the hands of Korean people. And it wasn't just paranoia. The most frustrating point in my teaching career came when I had just finished interviewing potential students for a translation workshop and was asked to reopen the application process because there weren't enough foreigners in the applicant pool. The majority of those I'd interviewed were Korean American, Korean Canadian, uh, Korean nationals who'd been who had been educated outside of Korea, but that didn't seem to count, nor did the fact that they were fully bilingual and wrote so well in English that I was hard pressed already to choose from among them. I refused and the class proceeded with a room full of Asian faces, not even all of which were Korean, but the message had been received. Now, every once in a blue moon, I encounter a different thing the well-intentioned but flawed assumption that being biracial, not bilingual or bicultural, but biracial, makes one uniquely suited to translation. In some ways, it's even harder to argue with these folks because they really believe they're saying something nice and complimentary, and maybe even visionary. But if this were true, there'd be a lot more biracial Koreans with published translations and far fewer biracial Koreans qualifying everything we say with, I'm only half, but or being told that we can't translate or critique a translation or say anything about Korea at all because we're not really Korean. And for a recent example of this, you can look up the name Young Mi Mayer. Uh, she critiqued the translation of the Squid Game subtitles and was attacked online for not being Korean enough to do so. Not because her critique wasn't perfect, it did have its issues, but because her physical appearance and her blood quantum weren't pure enough. The basic problem with the idea of who should translate or judge a translation is that it assumes language skills are not acquired, but are rooted in our blood, in our race and ethnicity. And because we're trapped along this imagined binary, it likewise assumes that mixed people can't be both, can't be native Korean and native English speakers. It can only be one or the other or incomplete at both. When I see discussions of Korean literature translation being reduced to liberal, literal versus liberal, originalist versus activist, I flinch at how closely it aligns with racialized thinking, East or West, yellow or white, us or them, perpetual foreigner or native son. And despite my own theoretical potential as bridge, my own work has been judged as both too literal and too loose. And given that both things have been said about the same book, the only real difference was who was doing the judging. Had I written this, now had I written this uh, talk a year ago, I would have ended here with an appeal to pay more attention to whose voices are missing, who is left out, and what might they bring to Korean literature and translation if they're only given a chance? Um, are there people working in corners of literary translation that are overlooked because their work is dismissed as too genre, too faddish, too outside the mainstream, or because they don't look like what a translator of that text should look like? I would have wrung my hands over this, though I do admittedly still wring them pretty hard each time I hear from a fellow mixed Korean who might be interested in literature and wants to know how they might get started as a translator but prefaces their query by saying, I'm only half, but I would be fretting much more over translators being reduced to either too Korean or too foreign. But then I see the translations that are coming out and new translators that are landing contracts, this incredible range of voices that are and have been appearing. And I start to put those worries away because really, no matter what I or anyone else says about who should or should not translate, the translations are getting done, they're getting published and the pool is growing understanding of what literary translation is and what it can do has been expanding. Already I find myself being regarded as an old translator, and I'd like to believe that this talk I've just given is already hopelessly dated, as there is so much more interesting work and pedagogy being produced right now. But I share it in the spirit of warning uh, ourselves about what we shouldn't go back to, and maybe also to put the word out to any mixed Korean aspiring translators who might be listening to, please don't give up, don't minimize your right to be here.
maybe for our, our corner of the world right now, we have K-pop or Netflix to thank for this growing diversity. And maybe the pool of new translators will shrink again and become less diverse when another country produces the next BTS or wins the next Oscar. But for now, this change is and already has been happening. All we have to do is not get in its way. Thank you. Thank you, Zora. Thank you so much. Uh, and now we'll move on to Anton. Hello, I'm very honored to be speaking to you today at the Han Musuk Colloquium and the Institute for Korean Studies at George Washington University. Recently, I was talking to a young translator who was trying to break into literary translation, and he congratulated me on the imminent publication of my translation of Love in the Big City by Sangyong Park. He said he himself had been interested in the book when it had come out, but he had learned it was already being translated. And that of course, a best-selling book like that would have been snapped up by an established translator as soon as it had been published. So why did he even bother? Let's dissect what he just said for a moment. First of all, the rights for the English translation for Love in the Big City were snapped up before the book was published, not after. I know this because I was the one who sold this book to Tilted Access Press, and I sold it before it was even published in Korean. An agent did not sell this book. Changbi, the Korean publisher, did not sell this book. And LTI Korea certainly did not sell this book. I did, the translator. Therefore, it is wrong to say that the Korean version of Love in the Big City was a bestseller at the time it was sold to Tilted Access Press. A book has to be published before it becomes a bestseller. And again, this book was not published when it was sold to TAP. This is a verifiable fact, thanks to the Korean press who reported on the publication of the Korean version of Love in the Big City uh, when it got sold to Tilted Access Press, helmed by Deborah Smith, that she had bought the English rights to the book before the Korean book even came out. To this day, if you go to the online bookstores that sell the Korean version of Love in the Big City, they still use advertising copy quoting these news art stories. But this conversation that I had with that other translator and subsequent conversations I've had with people both in academia and the general reading public has made me realize that outside of the actual publishing world, people think magical publishing fairies go around giving out jobs to literary translators. And while the previous generation of translators have relied heavily on literary agents and whatnot to secure their contracts for them, translators of my generation and those who come after me have had to take a much more proactive approach to how we get our jobs. So I am taking this opportunity to present you with a case study, if you will, on how a translated book actually makes itself into the bookstores in this the year 2021. I've known of Sang Young Park's work since its debut in 2016, but it wasn't until the publication of The Tears of an Unknown Artist or Zaitun Pasta, the short story and not the book. I repeat, the short story and not the book, which happened in 2017. I was so moved by the story that I thought about translating it, but it was so long. Almost no one in the Anglosphere publishes a story that's over 5,000 words. And Zaitun Pasta was obviously going to be much longer than that. It turned out to be about 15,000 words in translation. So anyone committing to translating Sanyang Park in the year 2017 was going to have to do it on spec. This is a debut writer we're talking about uh, who is new in Korea, much less in English. So translating on spec, if we're talking about 3,000 words is uh, about 15,000 words. I suggested the story to a bunch of other translators some of whom are in this room, but uh, they all turned it down, saying that it was too long. So I decided to take matters into my own hands. I contacted Sangyong and got his blessing. I didn't get his permission because it wasn't his permission to give. I had to go through the Munak Dongne Rights Department for actual permission. Bear in mind that at this time, the book hadn't come out yet, and I had read the story in Munak Dongne's quarterly magazine. After some difficulty, because there is always complicated rights issues with Korean publishers that I don't have space to get into here, I managed to get conditional permission to submit. So I translated the story and shopped it around to Plowshares, which has a separate magazine imprint for long short stories, and Asymptote Journal and Words Without Borders. Plowshares passed, Asymptote said it was too long and they would not even consider it, and Words Without Borders accepted on the condition that we serialize it in three parts 
but we were to be paid not for three stories, but for one. Sanyang and I agreed to these terms, and the story went on to be the most clicked story on Words Without Borders for at least three months running. Around this time, Deborah Smith, the publisher of Tilted Access Press, happened to ask me if I had a book manuscript I'd like to pitch to TAP. She invited me to pitch any book I wanted. By then, the book version of Tears of an Unknown Artist, or Zaitun Pasta, had come out into the world, and so I pitched that book to her. Deborah really liked the story and my translation of it, and she liked the chemistry Sangyong and I had as author and translator. But then she asked if we happened to have a novel instead of a short story collection. And that is when I handed her the manuscript version of Love in the Big City. Deborah signed the book and hired the Portuguese translator and former Wiley agent, Julia Sanchez, to sell the book to an American publisher, which she did to Grove Atlantic, who acquired it for their Black Cat imprint, but were so thrilled with the pre-release reviews and buzz surrounding the translated manuscript that they bumped it to their Grove imprint and upgraded it from paperback to hardcover, coming out uh, in November 15th in the States. The translation has received star re reviews from Kirkus and Publishers Weekly and is a fall selection of the American Booksellers Association. The Korean version of Love in the Big City was published just before the sale to Grove Atlantic and again after the sale to Tilted Access. It went on to become a huge bestseller in Korea, topping every bookstore chart, and is probably the best selling Korean novel of 2019 and 2020 at 26 printings to date. When I went up for auction in the US, I was asked by one of the bidders if the book could be characterized as an underground hit in Korea. I said, no, it could be characterized as an overground hit. But that happened after my sale. This is not to say that for every one of my 10 book deals, this is the process I went through. But for those 10 books, I've only had one instance where someone just gave me a book to do without me having to do any sample work or taking meetings with editors or doing any kind of persuasive emailing and answering endless questions and translating copy and reviews. And interestingly, that happens to be the only one of my books that isn't, oh, that is an English to Korean translation and not a Korean to English translation. This is because there's a whole system in place for literary translation from English to Korean. And the whole thing works pretty seamlessly. Korean publishers ask professors and editors and whatnot what to publish, and they get a list of books they want to acquire, and they query agents about rights and negotiate head rights, after which they hire a translator and commission the translation. Sure, translators going from English to Korean also do discovery and scouting, but that seems to be the exception and not the rule. Working from Korean to English, however, is still something of a wild frontier kind of situation. We do have heroic literary agents working on the Korean side, like KL Management or Green Book Agency or the redoubtable Barbara Zitwer. But the process of a Korean book turning into an English one is still fraught with hostility and intrigue and bizarre race conditions. Translators are still asked to be a kind of agent of last resort where we have to balance the interests of author, rights holder, and English publisher and write endless emails for free. Because if you don't, you'll never get a book to translate. When I was entering the field, there were about three agents working in Korean literature and they would rehire the same three translators over and over again. These three translators didn't have to do any scouting or discovery work and they're the last generation for whom people just gave books to them to translate. Having arrived later on the scene, I realized I couldn't hang my entire career on waiting for one of these three to retire or pass on a work that's too difficult for them. I had to go out and get my own books. And that's what happened with Love in the Big City and also Bora Chung's Cursed Bunny, which is out now in the UK from Offered Star. I sold these two books, me. I figured out how to get legal advice for contracts, how to pitch a book, how to write proposals, how and where to submit, and how the book promotion ecosystem works post-publishing, and how to get funding. There was a time when 100% of my so-called translation time had something to do with tracking down and applying for funding. As academics, I'm sure you all sympathize with that part. So let's discuss a more recent deal that I was in, and that is in selling Duna's book, Counterweight to Knopf. While about half of my translated books were essentially my own sales to publishers, the other half were with collaborations with agents, which is something I find myself doing more of now that more people in the industry seem to know me and trust that I can actually do what it says I do on my website. 
The Duna project was proposed by the completely awesome Green Book Agency, which is a new literary agency in Korea specializing in speculative fiction written by non-men. They secured me sample funding for Counterweight, which was published in Korea by the ambitious former imprint of Munak Dongne called Alma Books. And LTI Korea brought them into the room with a Knopf editor whom I happened to have met at an American Literary Translators Association conference the year before. I had perched, uh, pitched Cursed Bunny to Knopf and he had passed on it, but he had been very intrigued by the work and invited me to pitch to him at any time. After Green Book's pitch, I threw myself into creating as much ammunition as possible for Green Book and the Knopf editor to make the acquisition, creating a proposal and a detailed synopsis on top of the sample, taking meetings, and even featuring the book in a KBS radio show that I make regular appearances on and passing on the script to the Knopf editor. I remember how one meeting was late at night as my husband and I returned from a vacation, me taking the call in the passenger seat as my husband drove. I was on vacation. I was not getting paid for this meeting. I'm not proud of the work that I do on spec and I do not wear it like a badge of honor, but I really, really wanted to land the publishing house that published Michael Crichton, Toni Morrison and Julia Child, and it must be said, Kyung Suk Shun. So I did what I had to do and it paid off. So you can see publishing fairies do not come to my room at night and drop translation contracts on my pillow. If anything, I'm the publishing fairy. The English publisher doesn't have the Korean to determine if the book is a good fit. And the Korean author doesn't have the English to persuade the English publisher that it is a good fit. Who ends up doing the sales work here? The translator. And this is why if you want to do this work full time, it's not enough to be perfectly bilingual or good at translation, whatever that means in the year 2021. It's not about being competent, safe, polite, basic, award-winning even, or a good student. You have to be iconic and you have to be ready to get out there and bang your head against the ground, hoping to strike gold. Okay, that's as far as I got. Love in the Big City, again, is published in the US on November 15th. Next, I hope you enjoy the iconic Sophie Bowman. Anton, thank you so much. Sophie, hello. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I don't know, I feel very strange about following three of my mentors <laughs> from of my years of translating, but I'm gonna try and kind of give a general overview of things that will hopefully be interesting to some of you. I'm gonna read. Um, although I have limited and maybe atypical experience of translating for book publication, since 2012, I spent a lot of time engaging with the institution of translation, which people seem to be very interested in, um, as an LTI Korea student, a freelance translator, and a participant in various workshops, conferences, and translation groups. Um, so first today, I'm gonna to talk about my experiences of translating three very different books for publication, and then discuss some of my views on the institutions of translation that I've engaged with. Uh, just in case anyone gives up on this thing midway, let me say now that literary translators need to be paid better, need to be paid more per word, paid some of their fee before or during the time they are working on large projects, paid in a timely manner according to their contracts, paid royalties, and paid when rights deals are based uh, or assigned based on their translations. Um, I'll also add here that the translation of Korean literature into English has always been tied up with politics. Um, English is an, is an imperialist language and decisions about which works to translate and where to use time and resources does not happen in a vacuum. Um, I would argue that an awareness of this has been an important starting point for some of the translation in initiatives that I have found most compelling recently, such as Chogwa Magazine and the Smoking Tiger Tigers Translations Translators Collective. I have to slow down. <sighs> So now I'm going to talk about my experiences of book publication. Um, I started working on various literary translations in earnest around 2015, um, and I've translated short stories, poems, excerpts, basically anything um, uh, that I could. <laughs> um, but today I'm going to talk about the books. So here goes. Um, published this spring, I'm Waiting for You and Other Stories started out as a passion project um, and then really took on a life of its own. So while translating the title novella, which at the time was a kind of palm of the hand size book, I applied to Pen Presents, the Pen Presents program by English Pen, and also won an LTI Korea sample grant. Being a novella and a work that I was totally in love with, um, I translated it 
to the very end, despite not having a full, a full grant or a publisher lined up at the time. Uh, grants were contingent on having a publisher, the full payment of a grant at the time. So I sent my manuscript to the author, Kim Bo Young's agents, Green Book Agency, who already had a shout out, Chi Hyung Kim and Chin Yi Park. And they sold it to Harper Voyager as a full length book packaged, packaged together with The Prophet of Corruption um, that came out in Korea as its own book and also a sequel to the title novella, which hadn't even been written yet. Uh, anyone who has read the book, has, who has read The Prophet of Corruption will know that it's a very complex and mind bending work um, and it was way beyond my ability. So thankfully, star translator Sung Yu of Shoko's Smile fame uh, came on board to translate, to translate the novel and she did an amazing job on a very difficult work. She also won a Daesan translate, a translation grant, but more importantly for me personally, uh, we became collaborators and advocates for each other when it came to the process of editing with the publisher, writing translator's notes, going through contracts, proofreading the publication copy, which had typos <laughs> amazingly, um, and later getting our names on the covers of paperbacks and reprints uh, coming up um, in next year, as far as I know. Um, to talk a little bit about the reception to that book, it's been kind of interesting. So it was published with a genre specific imprint of a, of a very large publisher. So most of our initial reviewers were SF readers on Goodreads. A lot of them got the book for free. Um, and they seem to engage with the stories from the direction of genre rather than having any cognizance at all really of them as Korean. Um, later, MRL Mota for the New York Times and Christy Styles for Asymptote wrote in their reviews, not about Korean literature, but specifically about translation. So the labor and interaction that goes into it and the potential unleashed when SF is translated. Um, so that's the first one. Uh, the second one it was published last year, Looking Back, Life, Life Was Beautiful, was a very different project. Um, it was a work for hire where the Instagram creators at Drawings for My Grandchildren had signed a contract with a large publisher and were looking for a translator. The lead time was short and the pay was fair, but it was a one-off fee. So one interesting, about the, one interesting thing about this project was that all of the poems or short prose pieces in the book had already been translated for the 400,000 follower Instagram page by the couple's son, um, a Korean raised in Brazil and living in the US, but the family wanted a professional translator for the book. I really liked his translations, <laughs> um, but they, that, that's what they decided to do. So many of the, piece, the pieces in the book are about the creators' lives as Koreans in Brazil, about their childhood experiences of war and poverty, and about their recent return to live in South Korea. As far as I'm aware, this project received no support or intervention from translation institutions, which is kind of a rare case um, in the translation of Korean works into English, but maybe is a, has something to do with the genre of the work. Um, so while the book does address Korean and diaspora experiences, I would say that from its very inception, begun in Sao Paulo for a child living in New York, the project was global, global, and also challenged traditional ideas of what literature is, let alone what Korean literature is, while reaching a vast and adoring international audience. Uh, and finally, published just this autumn, uh, Magic Candies is very different again. One of Astrid Lindgren Memorial Award winner Beck Hina's more recent picture books, um, in this case, the publisher had already decided to publish the book and chose to bring me on as translator. Uh, it was published by Amazon Crossing Kids and my working terms were very excellent. <laughs> um, and it was a real honor for me to work on this book. It's very perfect and I've already, always admired the author. So uh, the reception of this book has also been <laughs> kind of interesting. Um, utilizing Amazon's wide reach and captive audience, the book has received a fair amount of attention upon release and it already has about 800 ratings on the site. So because everyone's buying their copy there, um, they're, they're leaving their reviews there. And the reviews are interesting to say the least. Um, they're overwhelmingly good, 60% give us five stars, thank you very much. Um, but there are also plenty of one star reviews and many of them say things like um, that the content is inappropriate for children or that the story does not translate. Um, I'll quote one commenter, who says, it's a shame it was written strictly for an Asian audience and not for other cultures to try to understand Asian culture a little better. Whew, okay, <laughs> there's so much to unpack in this sentence. Uh, do American dads not fart? Do American children never lose their grandparents or go out to play? Has the commenter not come across the dozens of books written specifically to give readers an understanding of different aspects of Korean cultures, Asian cultures, any... Anyway, 
I could go on. Um, but here again, in the good reviews and the bad, I see that readers and reviewers are not talking about the book as specifically Korean. And for the most part, they're engaging it with it the way it was written to be read as a cute and lovely and also amazingly visual children's book. Um, so thinking about these three books and the way that they came to be published in my translations, it feels a bit like I've been riding that famous wave that everyone likes to talk about. I've taken opportunities that came up as Korea was becoming mainstream and the mainstream was being redefined with genre fiction, social media and relatively new publishers all playing a part in that. That said, I think it's fair to say that before any of these three projects came about, I was already trained, I was practiced and I was, I was organized, I was ready to go. Which brings me on to my discussion of translation institutions and organizing, which may be a bit confusing and not well structured, but I'm gonna do my best. So having spent years in the LTI Translation Academy system and participating in various activities run by other organizations, but like this conference itself, uh, this colloquium itself, often funded by uh, the Literary Translation Institute of Korea, I've been invested greatly, uh, invested in greatly over the years. But for now, at least, the research of Korean literature is my main focus as a PhD student, rather than translation. So aside from just enjoying reading, research and writing, some of the reasons I am not translating as my career include the instability and uncertainty of it, and because I struggle with speed and pace, uh, meaning that the kind of translation schedule I would need to have to earn my keep as a full-time full translator would be very bad for my health. And I have learned this by doing and by observing many of my translator friends, um, basically having to stop translating for um, periods of time. So I also want to add a disclaimer here because I'm already complaining that um, for about five years, the bulk of my income came in one way or another form from translation related, translation -related institutions. So um, I've received stipends, grants, paid work and prizes. Um, but at the same time, <laughs> I'm very grateful. Um, but also during that entire time, I had very, very low rent and I had no dependence on major overheads and that's how it was possible. So to think about the Translation Academy, the LTI Translation Academy, I think it's important to remember that each student comes to the courses with their own skills and needs. Um, but for me, the initial LTI course was important as a way just to start translating in earnest and to improve my Korean, um, which I had been spending a very long time doing, but still needed to happen and still needs to happen to this day. Um, and the only reason I was able to consider applying for that course was that there was a stipend which I have to say very disappointingly is still only awarded to international students, international as defined by passport, which needs to change. Um, so in later courses, namely the Translation Atelier, um, workshopping my works in progress with widely published translator Sora Kim Russell and a group of working translators, which included Anton He and Zhang Yu, um, was incredibly important in terms of taking my translations from adequate and accurate to polished and enjoyable and providing the beginnings of an understanding of the publication process and industry. I learned a lot from Sora's um, experience and also from conversations with my fellow translators who were just starting out as I was. So this time I was able to, tend, uh, to attend for multiple years because I was receiving the ICF Literary Translation Translator Fellowship, which was mentioned earlier, um, the, I, the ICF International Communication Foundation of Korea as a graduate student of Korean literature at Yuho Women's University. So the ICF fellowship meant that I was able to live and eat in Seoul while studying, um, which isn't easy. <laughs> um, and interestingly, to my knowledge at least, the fellowship amount was never raised since its inception almost 20 years before, despite inflation and the rising cost of living in Korea. So while there are even more worthy and eligible candidates around now than there were when I did it, um, I was the final recipient of this fellowship, which was incredibly important in supporting the training of many Korean liter literature professors and creatives. Um, if you look at their list of past recipients, you'll see multiple professors, two of our most prolific translators. Um, and I would like to say that restarting this initiative would be a very noble investment for any interested organizations or philanthropists. Um, so since my initial years practicing literary translation, my thinking and ideas have developed quite profoundly as I've built up experiences and relationships. And I'm gonna to try to trace these developments, but there are probably a hundred different ways to start and 
end and leave this story. So this is just the version of today. Um, in 2015, the LTI began funding a Korean translation workshop at the British Centre for Literary Translation Summer School. And the following summer, Hangang and Deborah Smith won the Man Book International Prize. Uh, and these two things kind of changed everything. The BCLT Summer School was an opportunity to work on a translation as a group at the slowest pace possible. Whereas before that, I'd been kind of forced to uh, work with a co-translator or um, and then kind of relished working on my own and I'd always been racing against the clock. So significantly also, the summer school was attended by a diverse mix of translators working with other languages and their own respective institutions, set, sets of institutions. And it introduced me to inspiring mentors and translation superstars who, unlike many Korean translators, were doing literature one way or another full time. Uh, they weren't professor translators, they weren't scholars or academics, they were basically writers, right? Um, and the Booker Prize was something different. It felt like the ultimate win for Korean literary translation into English. And yet the discourses around it, where I was in Korea at the time at least, all left a very bitter taste in the mouth. So Korean media outlets never forgot to include the line, paranun regugin, referring to the translator as a blue-eyed foreigner. And well-paid scholars, many, many professors of literature in Korea were writing multiple articles in the news and, and in journals about the errors and translation choices made by a graduate student. That is what Deborah Smith was at the time. Um, and this brought to the fore old debates in translation, such as what it means to be faithful and what kinds of people make the best translators. Until that time, naively enough, I hadn't felt much need to engage with these debates. Back then, I just thought that me and, my trans and the translators I knew, who happened to be mainly Korean, were all just doing our best to do what felt right. In the midst of the discussions going on after the Booker win, however, taking a stance felt urgent. For the record, there are many ways to be faithful, as all translators know, as all translators know and many factors and act actors that influence translation decisions. And I will say that what makes a good translator is not a certain kind of person. You can read that as race, as birthplace, as fancy degrees, whatever, whichever professor decides it is that day. Um, but instead, talent, whatever that means, proficiency, practice, getting the work done, and for now at least a separate source of income or the ability to ration fiercely and live off tiny amounts for your food and rent. So around this time, I also began to feel that there was a change in the kind of scarcity mindset that had been prevalent previously. So, I mean, what I mean by that is the feeling that there weren't enough works or writers or grants to go around. Um, the timing may be coincidence, but it felt like the number of opportunities and the active interest from various publishers and Korean writers and their works was multiplying um, around the time of the Booker win. But this big win didn't always feel like a win, <laughs> and it made me more, more aware of and able to articulate a frustration with the way we translators were always being pitted against each other in competition to win or fail on the basis of the judgment of gatekeepers who often disagreed with each other and had niche or no connection with the publishing world our work was ultimately aiming for. Uh, as I tried to make more of my living translating literature rather than anything that anyone would let me translate, it became clearer to me that if we really were competing with each other, we were fighting for crumbs for spaces on life rafts that often went nowhere. What most of us were actually doing though, was trying to navigate an opaque and confusing set of potential opportunities in order to be able to keep translating because we love translating and also have food to eat and roofs over our heads. With all this in mind, in 2017, when the inspiration came and the timing felt right, a, a friendship group of translators, including myself, got together as the Smoking Tigers Translator Collective to support each other through the obstacle course of pitching, funding and translation and to promote each other's work. Not tied to a university or institution, but finding strength in numbers and the sharing of information. Smoking Tigers manuscript workshops and the information that can easily be found on our website have helped us get our work out in translation and bring our translation work to the next level. More recently, in 2019, translator extraordinaire Soje founded Togwa magazine an online open submissions magazine where multiple translators translate the same poem and the editor writes a commentary on their contrasts, choices and challenges. Now approaching its 10th edition, which you can support on Tumblebug, I'll put links in the chat um, when I'm done, <laughs> um, or on the shop page of their website, chogwa.com, 
GWA. Togwa has become an important meeting place for the up and coming generation of translators. More interested than ever in playing with language, being brave and bold and learning from each other about all the multiple right ways something can be translated. Uh, these two translator-led collective efforts are examples of new initiatives in the Korean to English translation sphere that keep me from despairing when I read pieces by long established translators on the state of our field. We had two of these in 2020 alone. Uh, Bruce Fulton, who's here, who's here today, complained about full-time translators being, quote, in the thrall of a very few literary agents, end quote, and having sold out for, quote, limited commercial success, end quote, at the expense of professional conduct. In his introduction, uh, this was the introduction to a special issue of Translation Review, which was offensively enough titled, They Like to Sing and Dance, But They Don't Like to Read. Uh, and then Brother Anthony of Teze also, in a foreword to the momentous 50th volume of the excellent publication Korean Literature Now, decried that translators are still waiting for Korean authors to write something, quote, which can speak vividly to readers of every con continent, end quote, as though we've all been sitting around twiddling our thumbs and the Korean writers we love have not been writing. It is frustrating, to say the least, to see these sentiments being given such prominent platforms. If I try really hard to find a positive here, uh, <laughs> yeah, perhaps these bad takes give us even more reason to keep making and maintaining our own platforms and can encourage us to help each other even more than we already do in the competitions we are faced with and to celebrate each other's successes, like the publication yesterday of Love in the Big City in the UK um, by Anton Hare. So unfortunately, though, as fun and, and affirm affirming as my kind of ideas of how we can deal with this are they all also work really hard real work like twitter is work too people get to get paid to run twitter accounts right um, and this is work which goes largely unpaid and more often falls on the shoulders of translations translators who are still getting established translators without professorship professorships or stipends translators who have been given less support than their colleagues because of their nationality or country of residence I don't have any specific recommendations for translation institutions with regards to this problem. I don't think they'd listen to me anyway, but I want to repeat that literary translators need to be paid better. They need to be paid more per word. They need to be getting paid before or during the time they're working on large projects. Ongoing stipends are even better. Their invoices should be paid in a timely manner and their contracts include royalties and translation copyright. As our community grows, as it is doing now in a very, very exciting way, I hope that we can empower each other more and more to demand the best possible conditions for our work so that translation from Korean can be the wonderful and worthwhile and respected profession that it has the potential to be. Thank you very much. Sophie, thank you so much. Well, first of all, I wanna thank all of our translators here today for their difficult task of not only translating, but uh, trying to become visible in this global world. Uh, I really appreciate their work and I really appreciate their genuine uh, thoughts presented today. Now, for all of our attendees, uh, if you look at the bottom of your uh, screen, you'll see the Q&A box. Please click on that and type in your questions. And as we wait for our attendees to ask questions. Let me begin uh, this discussion uh, with a few questions and get the uh, momentum rolling here. I'm gonna ask very, oh, so uh, sorry, if, uh, if our translators could uh, turn on their camera uh, so that our attendees could also, uh, yeah, see all of them. Um, right, so, I'm going to ask very uh, a very practical question, uh, and maybe we can uh, start from there. And that is, uh, well, we sort of know uh, the motivation behind LTI Korea. We know what they've done in the past, and we know what they're doing, uh, and we know their uh, agenda for the future. Uh, it's pretty clear, it's all on their website as well. And the time that I spent in Korea, I went through K uh, LTI Korea and I still go through them. 
uh, for various projects. Uh, I want to get, I want to hear from you uh, as I think all of you have gone through KLTI. Uh, Sophie said it very eloquently and far better than I could. And she laid out the uh, problems at KLTI. But now looking ahead, what else can LTI Korea do to uh, expand this field of translate translators and the process of translation, uh, connection to publishers, and so forth. And feel free to speak, any of you. Um, I'll go ahead and jump in with a response. Um, I think uh, one thing that has come up that I know for me has come up and, and that I've heard voice from others, um, and I, I uh pretty sure I gave a talk about it at an LTI event uh, a while back, which is that there is a lot of resources, there are a lot of resources being poured into scouting and quote unquote training or fostering new translators. But the problem is, what do you do once you're done with the course? Um, like for me, I took the the first um the the very first uh translation workshop that was offered by LTI. And when I was done, it was like, it was either just uh, apply for grants or start teaching. Um, and I had to start teaching in order to survive, basically, because the grant money, it's, it's, it, it, it was generous at the time. It hasn't really, well, actually, I think it's actually gone down. <laughs> I think it's actually the amount being paid out has, has gone down. Sophie is already nodding. I know she can say more about that. Um, so the big, the big problem is like once you're through the course and you've, you've debuted as a translator, then what? Um, and you pretty much just have to hustle at that point. There's, there's a, uh, not a lot of sort of ongoing support. Uh, yeah, once you start working. I'll stop there and let someone else jump in. So sorry, you're saying... LTI Korea invites students to become translators by going through this course. But once they complete the course, now they're, they're on kind their of own. on your own. Yeah. And there isn't a, I mean, I don't know what it would look like, but look, well, like, for example, it would be interesting if there were um, some sort of a stipend so that you could work uh, in an open-ended way. So like right now, if you apply for a certain title, you can get uh, funds for that title, but um, but it's limited to that one project, right? So there's not, you're never going to be salaried, for example, as a translator. Um, and then the, the grants used to be, like I said, pretty generous, but there have been policy changes to make it more, to bring it more in line with, with what other languages pay. And so like for me, I've actually found that uh, what I get paid as a translator, I, well, I guess I should be careful here. Um, because I, I, I maybe need to really crunch the numbers to be sure, but I feel that I, I get paid less somehow the longer I work, mm. rather than seeing my pay go up with my experience. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it, it makes it hard to stay in the field, like as Sophie was talking about it, it, you need another source of income or support because, uh, or you're hustling all the time, uh, even on vacation, like Anton was talking about. Yeah. So I don't know exactly what it would look like, but um, but it would be great to just have more support for actual translators as opposed to um, uh, students or or yeah translated titles. How about others? I guess I should jump in. <laughs> seeing as I uh, talked so much about it, but um, the rate that Korea, LTI Korea pays for translations that it commissions, so translations for its magazines, et cetera, et cetera, has not gone up for at least 10 years. I would, I would assume longer. In that time, the price of, I don't know, samgak kimbap, which is what translate, many translators have eaten to stay alive while translating, has gone from what, like 501 to 1,200, whatever. Like, it doesn't add up. Um, and I noticed in the, in the speech from the president of the LTI, he was very proud of the number 
of translators that they have produced. But what are they doing, you know? And um, I love my cohort, but for the initial course that I took, I think two of us are still translating. One of them works for LTI. He's an amazing um, editor of their magazine. But the point is that it's not really about quantity um, in this in this game, right? Um, and we've had so many, at the same time, we've had so many great translations that have been won and done by a translator who really did their best, but couldn't keep going in this system. And it's really painful to see, to be honest. Um, and I think there are lots of different reasons for that. Um, some publishers have taken funding money and not promoted their books at all, not even given them their own cover, just a, a, a color and a generic font, right? Um, but you know, also asking like, what can LTI do? What can LTI do is 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 tricky. Like, I don't really know what they want. When they were established, um, as far as I have heard anecdotally, you know, the goal was the Nobel. Pretty openly, like, we need one. We deserve one, and I think that's true. Like somewhere, somewhere in in the Korean libraries and bookshops of Korea, there is someone who is much better than plenty of the Nobel literature laureates, right? But, you know, it's such a vague goal that there could be a million different ways of, of achieving it. And I think it changes um, so much over time. You know, there are government institutions, so they have to be very fair and very democratic and their employees have to change departments, um, uh, you know, after a certain number of years all the time. And that makes things difficult, even for the wonderful staff who we love very much. Um, so I think there is also an important law to be played by um, private institutions. And that's why I'm very, very sad that the ICF um, is no longer kind of as active as they were. Um, I think they had quite different goals as well, but it would be wonderful to see another institution um, come along and kind of fill in that, fill in that space as well. Sophie, since I was a child, my father's been lamenting about the injustice uh, Korean literature has faced uh, not winning a Nobel Prize. And he's outraged. He couldn't, he could not believe it. And he urged me to be absolutely bilingual so that I can do something about this problem. And when I translated a North Korean novel, my father said, you're going the wrong way. That's not the way we want to go, right? So I understand the frustration. Uh, I, I know what KLTI is trying to do. I understand all that. Jamie, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, when my students ask me um, whether at EY University or LTI, if they'll be able to um, make a living as a full-time translator, I tell them, no, 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 you will not make you will not be able to um, be a full-time translator unless you translate 24 hours a day. And um, the, the grant money, uh, the first time I received a grant from LTI was back in 2007, or maybe it was 2008. It was pretty early on. The grant money has, in fact, gone down significantly since um if i did not have all the teaching jobs i would not be able to translate but then translating while teaching means um spending summer and winter vacations translating and teaching during the semester which means no break for me um i'm pretty sure i will retire from um, active literary translation or just maybe translate um, much, much less by the time I'm 50-ish. There is only so much um, sitting my spine can stand. I think I will have to quit by the time I'm 50. I mean, it's pretty sad, but yeah, that's that's the reality. Yeah, uh, and it seems like the, oh, we have, okay. This next question comes from Jan. In the process of translating Korean history, language, or arts, 
what aspects do you place importance to take note of? And what do you think is a distinctive feature of translating Korean literature? Uh, do you do research before uh, you translate, uh, especially if it's referring to some historical event? Um, and what makes Korean literature unique, I believe, is the question. I've never translated literature of other languages, so I wouldn't really be able to make that comparison. But um, I guess one thing would be that it's difficult to, it's very easy to um, hide somebody's um, gender in Korean. And so if um, that particular character's gender is kind of like a spoiler for later, oh, it turned out to be a guy or it turned out to be a girl. Um, you have to do all kinds of acrobatics in order to keep it hidden. And so that's something that I find myself um, always kind of um, struggling with. Uh, other than that, I can't really think of anything. Also, I don't, I don't really know if there's anything um, distinctive about Korean literature. They're just all good stories to me. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, this next question comes from Mark. When you translate, do you consider whether to use contemporary usage slang or to use language to ensure that the translation endures for decades? I have a very quick answer to this question. I think that um, writers write, so for audiences, um, decades, maybe centuries to come. And I think translators translate for people who are living today. Mm. So um, that's who I have in mind when I translate. Mm. And I hope that somebody um, will translate the same thing I translated 10 years later, because I'm sure that person will do a much better job. Wow. wow that's a great answer. All right. Next one from Anne. Several of you have mentioned the process of pitching or selling a translation to publishers. What kinds of arguments do you find are more effective in persuading potential publishers to take on a work of Korean literature in translation? Are there any trends in effective pitches that you notice? Hmm, very practical, entrepreneurial question here. I think the person that has to answer this question is Anton, but I know that yeah, he's uh, where did he go? <laughs> he's getting his beauty sleep, which oh, all I of see. us need, all of us joining from Korea. Um, and this is actually a very difficult question because there is no golden secret thing. All publishers are different and different people working at different publishers are different. And that's kind of why agents are so helpful because they, they know people, right? Um, uh, LTI has this system where they, well, at, at least um, in the past, they bring publishers, editors over to Korea and kind of let them meet writers that they've um, published and kind of introduce them to new writers and things like that. And a few times I've been able to go along and meet publishers and kind of talk to them. And I don't really see a pattern. Um, you know, we, in the past, we've been told to say like, oh, who's the Korean Murakami? Why would anyone want that? Um, but, <laughs> or, or kind of make these kind of comparisons, but um, I don't really think that's where it's at anymore. And I would hasten, maybe try and guess that the secret to Anton's success is that he's a very outgoing and um, kind of persuasive person, right? He's great at networking. Um, and kind of figuring out what people want and really searching, like hunting down who is gonna publish the book that he really wants to, wants to do. Um, and we can't all be like that, um, which is why, yeah, a lot of translators have benefited from agents. Um, and yeah, I guess um, I have a little bit of experience now writing readers reports. Um, and the response that I got from the readers reports that I wrote, which weren't that positive was, 
I didn't feel like you really loved the book. So I think we're going to pass. So maybe a kind of the golden answer is to really, 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 really love the book and Mm. show them how much you really, really, really love the book. Mm. And unfortunately, that has meant doing work for free for so many of us (laughs) over the years. Um, And hopefully it won't always be like that. Um, But that's probably the, the short answer. Anyone else before we, yeah. I'll just jump in real quick. I just, what she said, like loving the book, that's really important. It's also unfortunately why so many of us do continue working despite the increasingly lower pay <laughs> and the, the difficulty of, of doing this alone. It's, we do love these works. And, and I think when that shows, when it comes through, it certainly can help to sell a book. But it also goes back a bit to your, the question you started with and that we all sort of ignored, which is, how the K-Wave may or may not have affected this. I'm not sure, well, I, I think Jenny's gonna speak to it. I'm not sure that it has, so I'm really curious to hear what Jenny is gonna say. Um, I know when I uh, uh, was um, first, I haven't, I haven't done as much pitching as, as Anton has, but when I have, the message that I was kind of hearing was that nobody wants a book just because it's from Korea. Yeah. It doesn't matter like, what's going on. It's not going to be a selling point. This has to be a good story. It has to be, there has to be um, something beyond simply the fact that it was published in Korea. Um, And in terms of uh, sort of trends, like one thing that I found coming up a lot more when I uh, started out was uh, I would get asked all the time if there were like about like crime novels um, because um, was it like Swedish crime fiction or whatever had done really well and so that was supposed and so then that was like well is there is there a girl with a dragon tattoo but in Korea so those kinds of things like trying to sort of um piggyback on publishing trends Mm. Um, that was my experience when I when I um first started sort of uh, learning a little bit of that side of it um yeah but as far as like how to pitch really well yeah unfort- like sophie said unfortunately the best teacher of that has left the room <laughs> yeah anyway all right the last question comes from young Ju. thank you all thank you to all the panelists for a very enlightening and heartfelt discussion in the olden days when scarcity was still the dominant factor shaping the field of korean literary translation and publication I think the distinction became between academic and commercial publishing was less relevant. As Korean literature becomes more mainstream, thank you to all the translators for all your work, what can academic publishers do to support literary translation? Do you think we are at the point where the distinction could become meaningful? I can start seeing as I'm kind of still in university context. Um, uh, academic publish- publishers are really, really important for translating dead authors. There are so many great, amazing dead authors and their great, amazing works, and it's almost impossible um, to, for them to be published by commercial publishers, right? Um, uh, when you're talking to a publisher or an agent about a book, they're sometimes interested in that book, but they're usually interested in what the next book is, right? Or kind of what this what this author's career trajectory is or something like that. Um, And we still really, we need really good full on editions of all of Pagwanso's works. Um, You know, like Toji, right? Land by Pak Jong-yi still has not been translated in its entirety into English and it has to happen, right? God bless the translator who does it. Um, But that is the kind of thing that we really need academic publishers for and also for other kinds of writing essays all Korean writers pretty much have their own book of essays and some of them are really really amazing Um, and it's pretty impossible to have them published with a commercial publisher right Um, so there's a a whole wealth of of great stuff and I think um, yeah that it's very it's very important for us anyone else um, I guess what I, in terms of what can academic publishers do to support literary translation, um, I guess what the, if, if there's any advice I can give, it would maybe, there's so many, there's so much translation uh, that's been supported by academic publishers, but I guess the thing that I've heard is that uh, 
they don't, the books don't necessarily get publicized very well. So they exist, they go into libraries and then um, they're just sort of there. I know when I started out, uh, or not when I started out, there's some point uh, where I kept hearing this refrain that there was like, there was no Korean literature in translation, that there were no books available. And it always kind of puzzled me because I know when I was in college, um, I wanted to read literature from Korea and, and I found it in my college library. And so I was kind of like, puzzled by what they were talking about because I found the work and it took me a minute to realize that you know I had to go look for it in that library that I was motivated um, but that's different from getting books out to readers who wouldn't necessarily be looking for it and I think that's maybe where some of the I don't know if I want to say disappointment or or critiques of academic publications have or publishers have uh, have come up that yeah, the books get made, but then, but then what happens? Great. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the audience members who asked questions. Uh, we're gonna move right on to the second panel. And our two distinguished speakers in the second panel are Bruce Fulton and Jenny Wong Medina. Bruce Fulton is an inaugural occupant of the Yongbin Min Chair in Korean Literature and Literary Translation in the Department of Asian Studies at the University of British Columbia. I thought I had a long title. He is the co-translator with Chu Chan Fulton of numerous works of modern Korean fiction, general editor of the Modern Korean Fiction series published by the University of Hawaii Press, co-author with Yongbin Kwon of What is Korean Literature? recipient of the 2018 Manhe Grand Prize in Literature and editor of the forthcoming Penguin Book of Korean Short Stories. He is the co-recipient with Ju Chan Fulton of several translation awards and grants, including the first National Endowment of the Arts Translation Fellowship for a Korean Literary Work and the first residency awarded by Banff in Canada, International Literary Translation Center. His most recent translations with Ju Chan Fulton are novels Mina by Kim sa -wa, The Catcher in the Loft by Chan Eun Young, and One Left by Kim Soon. The title of his talk today is The Way We Were, Reflections on Pre-Pandemic Translation. Bruce, why don't you go first? And then when it's Jenny's turn, I will introduce her separately. Bruce? As you were reciting that very uh, extensive introduction. I, I think I made a mistake by saying National Acad National Endowment of the Arts. I think it's National Endowment for the Arts. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm always happy to be to be corrected. I want to thank uh, Youngie Kim Renault for uh, holding this meaningful symposium year after year after year. I remember during one of the very first symposia attending with the late great Pagwan So, and that was a very meaningful occasion. And uh, I also appreciate the extensive um, introductory remarks, Youngi, that you made. And I got to thinking that one translation of your good mother's works was that of her 1961 story, Deya Sogeso by Kim Jong-un, uh, a very fine story indeed among the marching columns. And finally, at any occasion like this where I am the, the one face that appears, please think of me in tandem with my good wife, Chu Chan, um, good wife and co-translator for over 40 years now. No I should mention that the, oh, and I was, I'm also happy to be uh, on the same panel with Jamie and Sora and uh, Sophie, uh, whom we have very good memories of when we first met and uh, also Jenny, uh, who I think is the, our oldest acquaintance among this group. The title of my presentation is 
reflections on pre-pandemic translation. And I should mention that the pandemic I speak of is not the COVID-19 pandemic, but rather the commercial mindset that in my mind has infected the process of the translation and publication of contemporary Korean fiction in particular. And this is a pandemic uh, for which there is no vaccine in the form of agreed upon standards of professional conduct. I want to start by citing a remark made by an outside reader of a translation of ours that currently sits at, on the desk of a academic press. The, um, as, um, as my colleagues who have tried to place translations with an academic press will know, when you submit, something to an academic press, the manuscript, in this case, the translation and the original Korean, are sent out to two or three uh, outside readers. And in the case of this work, one of the outside readers submitted four single space pages of comments. And about halfway through, we saw the comment, the translator must realize that the original Korean work is important. So that seemed like kind of a head scratcher to us. Why would anyone translate a work of literature that he, she, they did not consider important? And that got us thinking about our own 40 plus years of literary translation. And I suppose we could mention our decades of partnership with writers such as Wang Sun Won, Oh Jin He, and Che Yun, but I'm afraid we would come across as hopelessly naive and old fashioned. So instead, I thought I would direct my comments to this question, uh, this. Uh, question of the importance of the original Korean. And I would like to think that each and every one of our published translations, there's slightly over 200 by now, is important in some way. I would like to think that each of those translations made a difference, makes a difference. I would like to think that the works of trauma literature we have translated make a difference in persuading readers to revisit the stereotype of much of modern Korean fiction as adukta, gloomy, depressing. We would like to think that it is meaningful for readers to develop a sense of empathy and to understand that works of literature written by Korean writers may not always be positive, they may, might not always be humorous, but they are often due to the expectations of the Korean literature power structure involve issues. So we would like to think that our translations of Oh Jung Hee and Kang Suk Kyung and Kim Ji Won that constitute the volume Words of Farewell was important, that it was meaningful, that it made a difference. And we base those thoughts on remarks such as those of Elaine Kim, a pioneering scholar of Korean American literature, 
who used words of farewell at the University of California, Berkeley, and once said to us, you cannot possibly know how empowering these stories are for my students, especially my, uh, my female students of Korean ethnicity. We would like to think that our translation of Kim Sagwa has given some context to the increasingly frequent slogan, Hell Chosun. We would like to think that our translation of her works is important that people can realize that in spite of the increasingly influential stream of Korean popular culture, Hallyu, there is a dark side of contemporary Korea, especially the Seoul metropolitan area, which has contributed to the Republic of Korea having the highest suicide rate in the among the OECD countries, a negative birth rate, and a divorce rate of approximately 30%. We would like to think that our translation of Chun and Young's works has gotten people thinking about the legacy of military dictatorship about the legacy of institutionalized torture. We would like to think that our translation of Kim Soon's novel, Han Myung, One Left, is important in that it will get people thinking about the necessity of returning to historical memory the 200,000 plus girls who were taken from their ancestral villages we would like to think that we can begin to cope with the dramatic upheavals in Korean history, which has resulted in the victims of human trafficking, the victims of massacres, the victims of ideology, people who have been separated by the territorial division of the country, both geographically and psychologically. We would like to think that our translations of works such as the ones I've mentioned will help to recover anonymous groups of individuals who have been consigned to murky, dark, corners of modern Korean history. We would like to think that our translations of emerging writers, such as Kim Tae-yong and Chung Yong Jun, will um, allow readers to know that there is increasing diversity in contemporary Korean fiction writers, especially, and increasingly in contemporary Korean poetry. I'm afraid to say that drama um, lags somewhat behind in these respects. But I think that if we can focus on importance, I think that may suggest yet another answer to the iconic question raised by, you know, I'm having a brain short, but the, uh, the task of the translator Remind me of the Emmanuel. Who am I? Who am I thinking of? Uh, Benjamin. 
Benjamin Riss, Walter Benjamin, the task of the translator. Um, I think there we have it, that every, every translation matters. Every translation is important. Every work of literature that we translate is important. It makes a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, okay, finally, we have Jenny Wang Medina, Assistant Professor of Korean Studies in the Department of Russian and East Asian Languages and Cultures at Emory University. Her research focuses on questions of national, global cultures, diaspora, multiculturalism, canon formation, and translation, of course. She is currently writing a book manuscript titled Becoming Korean, K-Orean, South Korea's Quest for Cultural Distinction. The book examines South Korea's transformation of Korean culture from preservationist tradition to a dynamic cosmopolitan culture at the turn of the 21st century through literature, film, and television. Her talk today is called Minor Concentrations, Aesthetic particularity in contemporary Korean literatures. Jenny, welcome. Hi, thank you everyone for hanging in there. <laughs> um, and thank you. Uh, um, so uh, thank you to GWICS, Korea Foundation, the Department of East Asian Languages and Literatures, and of course, Professor Kim Reno and the Hanbusu Colloquium. Um, I'd also like to thank Emmanuel and Jisoo for their tireless work hosting scholarly conversations in all areas of Korean studies. Um, lastly, I would like to thank Bruce and Juchan for your decades of service to Korean literature and for being so instrumental in mentoring so many of us working in this field, both academically and commercially. Uh, I know you've persevered through a radical transformation of the field and the work, and um, I think we'd all be remiss in not recognizing your contributions. So um, in that vein, I'd like to continue to talk about the contemporary state of what has been called global Korea. Um, and while this K has become a signifier for global Korea in the 21st century, it can refer to a Korean peninsula that calls on many complex subjectivities in and outside the geographic space of the Korean peninsula. The concept, even Korea, has strong affective meaning for self-identified diasporic Koreans in the margins of a number of multicultural societies around the world. Calling something Korean, whether as K or Korean, is also influenced by the minority discourse of US racial politics, which has been complicated by the visibility of South Korea's cultural exports. The insistence on a unifying K that encompasses many different versions of Korean culture from the diaspora and from the divided peninsula, however, can be seen um, maybe negatively as an imperializing gesture that attempts to depoliticize national culture in the service of neoliberal subjectivity for the really for the bourgeois transnational class. In this presentation, I'd like to approach aesthetic particularity in Korean literature as ethnic minority and minority language literature um, as a step towards rethinking its relationship to Korean American literature. Um, and this I kind of bracket as a subset of what's now being called global Anglophone literature um, and uh, as ethnic minority literature. Uh, so ethnic minority literature and minority language literatures can be understood as both genres and translations that have the potential to contest the aesthetic norms of so-called universal world literature that are rewarded when properly transmitted, but then marginalized as, illeg as illegible or undeveloped when not. Um, okay, so that was a big mouthful. <laughs> so I'll back up a little bit and um, I'll, I'd like to discuss again, this K that everyone likes to refer to lately um, as an overdetermined signifier for Korean culture. Um, this is uh, to conceptually con separate this K era of South Korean cultural globalization from Hallyu or the Korean wave, which had a distinctly regional influence in East and Southeast Asia before becoming the Romanized K of global Korea. Uh, as Hallyu began to gain traction first in East Asia, then around the world through film, pop music, food trends and dramas, 
this branded approach of K-culture became the go-to designation to draw meaningful comparisons to different aspects of Korean culture. So I, I borrowed these images several years ago from the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism. Um, I know they're a little bit out of date at this point. Uh, I think that the, the K-pop is way out of date and uh, we've got Pororo still in there instead of Tayo, <laughs> but um, they illustrate my point, I think quite nicely. Uh, so this series of books about K-culture in several different languages was published um, from 2011 to 2014 by the Korea Culture and Information Service. But as you can see, in addition to music, fashion, art, architecture, food, television, sports, and beauty, South Korea has invested in literary translation as part of the efforts to de define Korean or what's now K-culture. We've seen how successful this approach has been, and we've heard from translators um, working in this field. Um, now that the K designation is well recognized as a prefix for anything related to Korea, but I think we should also be reminded that this K prefix was already in use in North America by diasporic Koreans to refer to the ethnic enclave of K-Town and was preceded in uh, global popular culture by J-pop, uh, not J-literature, any of these things. Korea, uh, Korea was much more strategic in utilizing this prefix to a, a much greater effect and certainly with the embrace of diaspora communities. Uh, all of this is to say that the image of Korea has undergone a major sea change over the past 20 or 30 years. And this change has occurred in dialogue with multiple claims to representing Korea in international media from South Korea, North Korea, as well as from different sites of the Korean diaspora. Uh, I have a few representative examples. This one on the left corner, bottom left corner is um, a bodega in New York City, which um, until the early 2000s was called a corner Korean, um, but it's just a grocery store. <laughs> Uh, uh, so just as South Korea has been grappling with the domestic issue of multiculturalism in recent years, ethnic Koreans and other multi multicultural societies have struggled with the complex identifications of state, nation, nation, ethnicity. But the now ubiquitous K to denote anything culturally Korean is tied to the understanding that all of these K things receive validation through South Korea. Um, and despite both North and South Korea uh, broadly referring to Hewe Dongpo or overseas compatriots in statements over the past few years, it has become clear that there are class and race based cultural hierarchies that have an effect on how Koreanness is conferred on different people and different groups. It is my contention then that the same can be said for what is considered Korean cultural content. Uh, regarding cultural content, this is something I've written about um, in South Korea shift from culture as tradition to culture as content elsewhere. But suffice to say, the highly successful neoliberal turn of Korean cultural production has been well documented. I would argue, however, that this shift has been beneficial for the image of Korean literature, uh, which has gained recognition as a literary tradition through the targeted support for literary translation. And this support has undergone several changes as well, going from a kind of external funding model uh, from UNESCO through to um, the Tessan Foundation, the ICF, and uh, the KLTI. What I would like to talk about today, however, is how to understand so-called Korean literature within the contested concept of world literature. World literature, of course, has been the topic of a lot of debate in the last two decades as theories of globalization from sociologists and anthropologists such as Manuel Wallerstein, um, Iwa Ong, um, Apadurai and Hart and Negri have come into productive conversation with scholars concerned with literature and culture such as Emily Apter, Peng Chia and Pascal Casanova, uh, who is, I believe a journalist, not an academic, but nevertheless, through these works, the conversation about the role of literature and humanities in the 21st century has moved from these kind of dire predictions about the demise of the humanities to a renewed sense of urgency about the role of humanistic social critique. So I've been teasing you a little bit with these quotes that if you're on a smaller screen, you probably can't see at all, but I'll turn to them now. And these are taken from the proceedings of the very first Desan International Forum of Literature in 2000. Um, Pascal Casanova echoed her sentiments from her 1999 book, The World Republic of Letters, um, when she offered her critique of quote unquote young nations seeking literary consecration through the Nobel Prize, uh, which 
should have been very well taken at a conference in, in Seoul um, as what she called a clear paradox that to try to win the Nobel Prize to assert one's literary universality is a strange and unexpected way to validate literary nationalism. This paradox that she's identifying here is, um, is actually answered quite directly by the organizer of the forum, Kim Woo Chang, uh, below in the next quote, uh, world literature often means Western literature or a literary field that can be ordered into a perspective from the Western point of view. And even those in the non-Western part of the world must aspire to appropriate this shaping force to shape their work. Uh, Wole Seyinka at the same at the same forum um, and Nobel laureate um, called world literature, quote, a canon of exclusion directed not at innovation, not at ideological armatures and stylistic developments, but at other cultures. So it only takes a step or two to conclude that world literature excludes literary aesthetics that have not yet been consecrated by international prize committees or the judges of whatever we're calling world literature is these days. Um, interestingly, I think uh, Soyinka's new novel, Chronicles from the Land of the Happiest People on Earth, um, directly engages with global prize culture to its perhaps I wouldn't say illogical, but I would say to its logical extremes, where nearly everyone in the world becomes prize worthy and international accolades really become determinative of lived experience. Um, but since then, there has been a change in terminology from thinking about world literature in terms of a post colonial model of center periphery to thinking about literatures of the global south or more recently global anglophone or global insert imperial language here phone literature. Um, these theorists of global anglophone literature readily point out the irony of linguistic boundaries like anglophone, francophone, lusophone, as reflections of the imperial histories that created these networks of literary exchange. But few have seriously worked across languages to try to articulate what a global literature without the biases of central center languages would look like. Um, for Korean literature, it's taken the contrast of contemporary depoliticized South Korea um, and I'll put that in quotes because it's obviously not depoliticized, but um, to, to make Korean realist fiction interesting to the global Euro-American audience. So really this is a question of um, development. Um, perhaps as a point of critique for the standardizing and detrimental effects of neoliberal global capital on the culture of a rapidly, rapidly developed nation. So division compounds the tendency for comparative association of South Korean culture, where curiosity about North Korea has also made South Korean cultural production a convenient proxy for just understanding both places. This sort of comparative reduction essentializes Korean culture, just as diasporic representations of Korea do in other countries. Um, so I have this image from uh, from The Guardian, and um, I, I did not talk to Sora about this before. We're not beating up on The Guardian or anything, but uh, nevertheless, they have this information. Um, so in 2014, Korea was selected as the market focus country at the London Book Fair. And the British press was characteristically blunt when admitting their lack of knowledge about Korea and their greater interest in North Korea. So this advanced write-up of the event spells out the terms of Korea's involvement, I think, as you can see in this headline and image, 10 Korean writers on a country sawn in half. This so clearly spells out the contradictory expectations for Korean literature um, as a potential world literature. So Korean literature kind of broadly, as, as presented by South Korean writers, must satisfy the quote, desperation to read the inside story of North Korea, which must be the quote, stuff of nightmares. It must explain its own nationally specific economic success in a very relatable way that overcomes the, the quote, rituals that separate them from the rest of us, and then present, again, quote, um, a tradition of family duty deemed so alien to Western readers that it is said to have been substantially adapted in translation. Here she's talking, uh, uh, specifically about the translation of um, Shin Jung Suk's Please Look After Mom. Um, at the same time, South Kore Korean literature must prove itself a better representation, a uh, better representative of Korean culture than the quote Western writers who write about North Korea and the quote unquote high profile South Korean authors who are based in the West. This is a very weird and convoluted <laughs> construction of, um, of Korean American authors. Um, for the most part, the South Korean delegation to the London Book Fair in 2014 was willing to wear these multiple hats. 
Uh, Yi Munyal, for example, explained, uh, said in an interview that uh, there was almost zero literary output coming from North Korea, and that in the case of the few nonfiction books that made their way to South Korea, even though the language is the same, we can't identify them. Uh, the forms and mechanisms are completely unfamiliar. We feel like we're reading South Korean books from 50 years ago, uh, end quote. Yi placed himself at a temporal distance from his North Korean so-called compatriots, situating uh, South Korea in a more advanced temporal location and echoing the ethnic hierarchicalization of imperial subjects. Yi's personal attempt to include North Korean writers in exile in the South Korean literary community, he said, was not met with much enthusiasm from the South Korean reading public, due, again, he says, to an ide ideological malaise. Um, he says, I believe it comes down to ideological differences. Um, if there is a film that is critical about North Korean society, people don't watch it. Ironically, if there is a blockbuster film about North Korea being a bad guy and the good guy is American, then people will go and watch it. Um, sorry. Yi's frustration with the lack of interest in real North Korea is compounded by what Arif Durlik calls the ethnic complicity in cultural reification. Here, however, we have a South Korean writer working to give voice to North Korean authors in an act of ethnic complicity that attempts to reject one reification of Korean culture, the imaginary unified ethnic Korea, while validating a vision of South Korean culture as a center country that can speak for the rest. So we can see here the conflation of quote unquote Korean authors. Um, so this is, one is from L Magazine, I think, is that right? Um, oh no, the bamboo-traveler.com. that's strange. Um, and the one on the right is uh, reading recommendations from Vanity Fair in November, 2015. And we can see again, the conflation of so-called Korean authors with Korean literature, regardless of the language in which these texts were written, regardless of translation. So um, not necessarily Korea phone literature, but literature written by racialized Korean bodies with a historic preference for self-conscious uh, Anglophone literature that writes within the aesthetic tradition of world or Western literature, um, while complicating also world literature's desire to tether race and ethnicity to place. So we see a lot of examples here of some of literature and translation, some written by ethnic Koreans, um, not necessarily all um, literature either. <laughs> um, in the end, so to connect this back to the London Book Fair in 2014, in the end, the expectations that the British press had for the South Korean delegation um, is a Korean literature that incorporates, incorporates multiple national, historical, and cultural identities and denies the historical specificity of each group. At the same time, there's an obvious bias towards Anglophone and Anglophone literary aesthetics that's tied to market focus and uh, this kind of commercial idea of what con constitutes literariness. Um, so I hope that through our work and through continued attention to the act of translation, uh, we can see a distinction between minority literatures and perhaps literature by minority authors. The question then becomes, how do we def define minority majority, uh, sorry, minority majority or periphery center in the world of literature? And even as we are expanding beyond this, we, we have to recognize that it still exists. Um, if we think in terms of minority languages, such as Korean, we should ask how the funding model of the KLTI, the, the Tetsan Foundation, the ICF, have disrupted um, the center periphery model of literary consecration. Um, anecdotally, in my work with various translation organizations, including the Panya One, the KLTI, and Penn International, translators of Korean literature have become kind of the envy of the translation world. Um, but as Anton spoke to and our, our illustrious translator have translators have spoken to, the role of individual translators in advocating for their literatures is quite important. Um, I will note, however, that since the establishment of the KLTI, several other minority language countries have established similar literary translation institutes, including Poland, Switzerland, Kazakhstan, Egypt, and, and others. Um, thus, we do see a double-edged sword. The neoliberal approach to cultural promotion that created institutions like the Panyogwan and the Tezan Munan Tezan has had an effect on at least the visibility of minority literatures. Um, while literature by minorities in multicultural societies remains more attractive as so-called world or global literature, and you can see this across the board, not just with Asian American writing, 
Um, recent prize winners from Italy have been about African, uh, have been written by African Italian uh, writers um, in, you can see this in, of course, in the, the broader empires of Anglophone literature and um, uh, Hispanophone literature, um, where there does seem to be a much more visible presence of Latin American literature over, say, uh, continental Spanish literature. Um, even there <laughs> with, with uh, Basque literature being something that's very interesting to a global audience. Um, so we can see this, this insistence on making visible the act of translation that, uh, um, that has complicated the odorlessness of globalization at the same time that we're still thinking about bodies a lot and kind of uh, racialized and ethnicized bodies and their relationship to the language of transmission. Um, at the same time, as we can see in these represent, representative examples of Korean American literature, there is still a clear racial optic that cannot help but influence the reception of minority language literatures in translation. Um, this is kind of a cross section of some very successful novels um, in, uh, by Korean American authors. And again, we almost never see direct um, a direct gaze unless it's somehow obscured. Um, like there have been many sociological readings of these kinds of images. Um, and we can clearly see a similar aesthetic at play in the marketing of both Korean language authors in translation and Korean or Asian Anglophone authors. So then how do we reconcile these conflicting demands? Um, I don't know, but <laughs> I would like to end with this image from a new comic book series by Jeremy Holt a Korean American adoptee author. Um, it's called Made in Korea. Uh, the comic takes place in a near future where children are replaced by robotic proxies. And a Korean engineer creates a software program for one of the robotic children that enables it to develop self-consciousness. Uh, this comic takes place in South Korea and the US. And here we can see this dialogue um, that uh, dialogue is referenced in translation. So it says, damn it, um, with no actual Korean referent. Uh, so we see this again, subtitling sort of that says translated from the Korean. But the impact of the visuality of Hangul is, is incredibly necessary for this text. Um, this shorthand for gesturing towards a translation of a, an, a, a quote unquote original text that doesn't exist leads us or at least leads me towards an understanding of the constellation of aesthetic particulars of Koreanness that has been in a moment of convergence in the early 2000s with this global Korea stuff. Um, but that I see us as leading us towards a, a kind of a much more interesting new divergence that has the potential to de-essentialize Korean culture. Um, so I'm going to end there and I'd like to thank everyone for, for sticking around and listening. Um, and thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts also. Well, thank you very much, Jenny. It's always a pleasure uh, to hear you speak. Uh, thank you to both uh, Jenny and Bruce for taking this time uh, and sticking around. Uh, our audience members who've been really patient uh, to persevere all this, this whole time. I, I will open it up for questions. Um, and again, please type your questions in the Q&A box. And as you process uh, the two lectures that we just heard. Uh, let me start again, uh, just to throw out some basic questions for our audience to start thinking and coming up with their own. Uh, so Jenny, this is a real fascinating presentation and uh, I love how you, the, the nuances that you presented, um, the, the globalization of Korean writers, Korean trans, uh, sorry, translators of Korean literature, Korean American writers, and so forth. Uh, and I see that you, the one of the uh, images that you put up there was uh, Suki Kim. And I'm kind of wondering your choice in putting uh, someone like Suki Kim up there along with some of the other more established writers. Um, sorry, thanks for that question, Emmanuel. I think where, where I, I just want to go back and see kind of where I put that. Yeah, ne next um, to Minjin and next to uh, Patricia. Ah, yeah. <laughs> uh, this was one of the first like Korean American novels that I read that um, I found 
portrayed a, a part of the diaspora that I hadn't really thought about much um, that that kind of contested the the model minority. <laughs> so um, I really enjoyed that book. But uh, she also has done this this kind of pivot where she's um, she's representing North Korea as well in her later book. And so um, I thought that it. Uh, her her work is an interesting case where she is a 1.5 or or even a first generation Korean American, um, and uh, the way that she has uh, has um, inhabited these roles is quite interesting and uh, sensational in some ways. So um, I, I do like to include her. Now, obviously, Min Jin is a fantastic author, and she's just gotten quite a lot of attention and has done so much great activism. Uh, so I must include her as well. Yeah, no, <laughs> um, no, and the cover absolutely. there is just like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do always judge books by their covers. <laughs> so. <laughs> no, oh. no, it's, it's, it's just really fascinating because um, one of your subtitles in your uh, upcoming manuscript is canon formations. So I'm curious to know uh, if there is some exclusionary uh, activity going on in, within your your own research uh, when you look at canon formations, who to include, who not to include, um, you know, and so forth. Um, I wouldn't say I'm an arbiter of canon. <laughs> so I would just say um, it's my book, so I get to choose. <laughs> <laughs> I like that answer. Yes, yes, absolutely. Right, uh, you, you, you have, you're the authority here. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. Okay. So we have a question from, oh, all the way from Italy. Uh, greetings from Italy and thank you all uh, for the insightful afternoon. I believe all have spoken about prose, contemporary. What about translating poetry and what about translating pre modern literature? Do you have experience in these parallel fields? Is your approach to translated texts the same? Oh, I believe this was uh, directed uh, at the translators, but since both of you are translators as well uh, as being scholars, um, how do you make of, and where does pre-modern literature, if we can call it pre-modern literature, fit into today's translation activity? I could try that one, Emmanuel. Uh, it, it enters in very importantly, if only to help remind us that there is a very strong oral and performative stream of the Korean literary tradition. So I welcome the publication of the anthology by Mike Pettit and John Park and Gregory Ivan. And I think I'm leaving out the fourth editor, but that was a, that was a welcome publication by Columbia. And uh, poetry has been well established, I think for decades now. Um, fortunately, I think the most of the publications have been done by small presses and academic presses. So uh, we're able to avoid the Juan Gay Ja who have insinuated themselves into the um, publication of translations of contemporary Korean fiction. And there will, poetry will always be a strong element of Korean literature and translation because it is really the heart and soul of the Korean literary tradition. So I don't think we have to worry too much about poetry and it's great to see that there is more gender, a more equal gender representation among poets being published in translation these days. We're not quite to where we are in terms of gender parity with, uh, with fiction, but certainly way ahead of the situation of Korean drama in, in translation. Um, can, I, can I jump in on this as well? Uh, so uh, I'm gonna share my screen one more time to, because this 
again, I'm going to show you another book cover. <laughs> um, but if you can see this, uh, the, the story of Hong Jiu-tong, yes. uh, translated by the fantastic Min Su Kang. Um, I use this example because this is a pre-modern text that has been included in the Penguin Classic series. This is a big deal, right? That um, it's become... Uh, that pre-modern Korean literature is being included in this kind of tradition. But again, even in this cover, we see this kind of infantilized version that, um, uh, maybe not infantilized, but we see this pop culture aesthetic associated with a Korean pre-modern tale. This comes out of an understanding of Asian popular culture as manga, manga or manhwa, um, we again see the hangul in there that's um, that's really speaking to a pre-existing understanding of what we want from, from Korean aesthetics. Um, at the same time that it's like classics. If you compare this to Pride and Prejudice or something like this, also from the Penguin Classic series, it's going to look very different. It's going to look very, um, I don't know, classical in a way rather than, um, rather than popish. Um, so... I would just add that uh, while things are changing about, um, well, it's very important, I think, that um, that this text was included in this uh, in this um, in this series. Uh, there is this way that we can understand um, the approach that has to be taken. Maybe uh, I think the tale of Genji looks very, very different as well um, because there is a visual register for this understanding, right, for this imagination. Um, I'll stop there. <laughs> No, it's a really interesting point. And also uh, the fact that he translated as the story instead of the tale, um, mm. that, that linguistically that has some different registers, right? I mean, once you say the tale, it sounds so old, right? And, um, but when you say story, again, it could sound a little more contemporary and appealing to our more, more modern readers. Um, Jenny, uh, so as we thank you, uh, Vincenza, for that uh, excellent question. Uh, and please, uh, for those who have questions, uh, type it in the Q&A box. Uh, I want to get back to this multiculturalism uh, that you alluded to, and I believe is a really important uh, component of Korean society today. Uh, as I watch K-drama, uh, I notice that there are more and more uh, uh, appearances of so-called non-ethnic Korean looking people, uh, Squid Game being uh, a prime example of a character who pretty much lasted quite some time throughout the series. Um, and they're not just uh, extras for the sake of being an extra, right? What about in terms of uh, literary representations of uh, these minorities? So Korean literature as a minority literature but within that category, representations of minorities that reside and make up and shape Korean culture today. Um, I think that maybe Sora and Bruce could speak to this better than I can. Um, um, oh, sorry, I, I got distracted by one of the chat questions, but um, certainly there has been an effort to incorporate um, this kind of multicultural vision of Korea in the literary sphere in a very way, in, in a way that I see as this kind of neorealism that's, uh, that I would connect to um, kind of earlier periods of Korean literature where, I, I don't know if this is going to be, um, inflammatory, but I, I have connected this to the idea of Minjun literature and these kind of polyphonic narratives where we're trying to draw a broader cross-section of, of uh, dominant Korean society. Uh, but this so far has been done by Korean, ethnic Korean authors. Um, and in doing so, it's also in drawing a picture of multicultural Korean society that, um, that others I guess, or like compatriots, right, in ways like even in Squid Game, we have the North Korean defector girl, and she's that that is a trope that's used constantly to 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 reference other Koreans so that multiculturalism becomes something that's not solely tied to a, a different racial body. It can be multiculturalism is really focused on the culture rather than in the US or something where it's extremely racially determined, right? Um, so I think that's one moment where we can see, uh, too, the literature working in different ways than, um, than visual texts. 
Uh, and I think because it can also be no, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. Please, please. Um, well, so I think this is a this is a space where literature can be very important because it gets into the interiority, right? In a way that that um, uh, visual literature or visceral text can't as can't in such a detailed fashion. Yeah. And I think I, actually that's a really good segue to David O's question. The story of Hunger Don't Cover also has a lot of Monkey King vibes, given the way he's drawn. I wonder if Western publishers racialize K literature and whether this is one of the reasons Korean culture industries and government are working so hard to overdetermine the K. Um, yeah, Jenny, you want to start? Um, if Bruce has wants to <laughs> speak to this, I'd, I'd love to hear his thoughts as well. Um, or Juchan too. Uh, I think certainly they do racialize K literature and there are definitely um, Monkey King, King vibes going on here. Um, but in that way, I think the choice of that image to um, it's I think it refers also to a constellation of, of Hong Yedong and of these kinds of popular Korean texts that have survived and that speak to a kind of a regional imagination of these old tales um, that I thought was quite cheeky in this way that it, it draws a longer history of popular, of Asian popular culture and um, Asian, like whatever we want to call traditional culture, right? So it, it shows that these things have persisted over time that these stories have had meaningful relationships with these communities for a very, very long time. And for that sense, like, I really love this choice. Um, and also it's colorful, so I'd, I'd like to pick it up if I can see it. Yeah. Bruce or Sora, any comments on the racialization of Korean literature and the overdetermination of the K? I would rather talk about the about the intertextuality that we see in well I prefer to focus not so much on Hong Kil Tong Jun but on on Korean folk tales that have been revisited time and again by not only by creative writers, but by film directors, TV producers, in some cases in both North and South. So, um, Smile. I, over the decades, have often found myself wondering, and I often discuss this with my students, what is it about the Xinjiang story that invites so many creative minds to revisit it time again. What is it about the Chunyang story? What is it about Huang Jini, about whom there is no documentary evidence of her existence, but we have a, an abundance of secondhand sources about her? That That's that's a subject I'd prefer to, to think about and discuss. Can I comment on that, Emmanuel? Yeah, yeah, of course. Bruce, I'm so glad you brought up these texts because they do repeat themselves in, in Korean literature over and over again. And I think they've been they've been taken up by popular culture even now as something that's very attractive and aesthetic. Now that's being also combined with things, I mean, Sora's translation, for example, of Paridegi, right? Of um, uh, Hwang Chang Young's, uh, what was it, Sora's? A tale of Princess Bari, <laughs> sorry. That was the English translation. Um, that takes this old tale and, and places it in, in a contemporary context. But at the same time, we see popular culture also taking up these, these images as, in different ways that is marketing it to a global audience. Like um, we see now Kumiho everywhere, right? <laughs> Which is a Korean folk figure or like kind of um, mythic thing that um, is now really globalized so much so that I was in the car the other day with my daughter and her friend and they were playing Cookie Run, this new game. Um, and she got really excited because she got the Nine-Tail Fox cookie. And I was, 
what is that a Korean game and she was like no I don't think so but it's this really cute fox with nine tails and then when she attacks she does this thing and I was like wow that is a really interesting way of inserting that tail into a global contemporary context um, that now it's going to become part of this kind of um, this mythic global imagination that um, that includes like goblins and now kumiho and like leprechauns and whatever right it's legible now and that was just fascinating to me um yeah so thank you for that Bruce. yeah sora if you're there any thoughts on the overdetermination of the k Hi, I am here, but I was mostly just kind of listening and learning and trying to figure out what that, <laughs> what over-determining something means. <laughs> well, um, yeah, so to give you an example, I'm a little ashamed to say this, but for example, our next HMS colloquium is on K fashion. So it's, it's everything has to be K something, K this, K that. Um, and, you know, are, are we going beyond what was, you know, originally intended or it's just, it's naturally this part of Korean culture, but why do we have to add the K in order to make it some, somehow sound more global or trendy or, yeah. Okay, I guess I can speak to that because as a translator, and maybe it's part of why this question was hard for me to answer because when I translate, I'm not, I, I don't really think like, okay, I'm going to translate a Korean book and what is Korean about it? And it's, it, I'm really focused on that writer, that individual writer. And if anything, what I'm looking at is, what makes this writer different from every other Korean writer? What is it about their voice or their thumbprint on the book, on the writing that I need to bring to life? And so the if if anything, I'm really consciously trying to work against this sort of K literature idea because I want this writer to stand out as themselves. So maybe that's why I'm kind of puzzled because I, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 that's a very valid point. It's a very valid point. And, uh, as I look at Mark's question, and I'll take that, I'll take this question as the last question for our session today. I'm struck by the distinction between Korean literature and Korean authors. Is there Korean literature being produced by non Korean authors? So, again, going back to the racialization, the um, ethnic identification, national identification, uh, the oh, age old uh controversy over what makes it korean literature you know if uh the three of you can speak on that that'd be great and we will end our session today emmanuel i can i can cite um, at least one fiction writer who's writing what i consider to be korean literature his name is tim fitz i believe and thanks to the efforts of the Sejong Society and Lucy Park and David McCann and Mark Peterson, we have now a number of people outside of Korea, uh, not necessarily Korean ethnicity, writing Shijo. Uh, I myself would um, like to see this uh, effort to regenerate a vernacular Korean verse form extended to Kasa as well. And I, I, I meant to mention during my, um, during my talk previously that uh, Ju Chan and I have translated a couple of um, Kunde Gihen Kasa written by Joe A. Young, who was a Shin Yosa Wannabe and the aunt of the poet Cho Ji Hun. And uh, I think, again, this is a way in which, uh, because of the, of the standard uh, four beat rhythm of, of the Kasa she wrote, this is another way of reminding those who are smitten by Hallyu that uh, Korean literature is very much an element uh, of the Korean cultural tradition. So um, yes, there, there is Korean literature being written by uh, non-ethnic Koreans. And perhaps someday, I'm 
I think this will be decades in the making, we'll see uh, a recipient of the Isang Wunak Sun, the Isang Literature Prize, most prestigious, prestigious award for literary short fiction uh, given to a person uh, who's not of Korean ethnicity, which is, I seem to recall the Akutiao Award in Japan went to uh, one such person quite some years ago. Anyone else? Um, I'll, I'll jump in here. I, I, uh, the, the point that Bruce just made about, uh, about poetry, like a particular, a Korean form of poetry uh, becoming internationalized just reminded, it made me think about um, some discussions that I've seen recently about prose and, and plot structure in fiction and the idea that what we normally think of as the classic plot is actually uh, more more true for Western fiction, for English fiction, I should say. And that like uh, with Korean story or stories and novels from other languages, we see different types of plot structures, different um, ways that books are paced. Uh, not all stories have the epiphany moment, for example, or the, the, uh, the um, conflict, the sort of conflict that you expect to see. And so it now makes me kind of gives me or raises this I'm sorry it's very late here so i'm trying to <laughs> speak clearly but now it creates this interesting question of if someone is writing a novel and using for example a korean plot form is it then a korean novel is it can we sort of push that idea of what makes a novel korean um to look at those types to look at form in other words normally like when i was coming into this this sort of simple answer i was given was it Korean literature is literature that's written in Korean. Um, but then as, as Jenny points out in her presentation, there's also this idea of literature written by the racialized Korean body, which we see with like Korean American novels by Korean American writers being added to lists of books in translation when they were never translated. So um, you know, my brain's about to spiral down into sleep, but uh, but anyway, I just, I, 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 I like that idea of, of maybe the form of the writing uh, becoming, maybe being allowed to define what Korean literature is as opposed to the, the body that wrote it. Yeah, yeah to, to echo that, um, that is the, the question of the aesthetics, right? Um, because uh, there is the sense that um, the things that do get a lot of attention tend to fit into the Western narrative mo mode, right, of prose fiction. And um, I would say that the best examples of Korean literature do not fit that well. Um, and that's why they might seem unapproachable or something like this. But that's something that, um, you know, that needs to be decentralized, I think, or at least um, deconstructed a bit. Um, I would think that you would have a lot to say about this, Emmanuel, because um, is, Korean, is there Korean literature being produced from North Korea? Because they don't call themselves Korean. <laughs> Um, it's Jusangunak, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's not Kumunak, it's Jusangunak. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, I mean, I could talk about this all day. And, um, you know, e even in my classes that I teach, we problematize this uh, nationalized term, Korea, uh, what that means. Um, in fact, my entire research began with the question of what is Korea? So, um, yeah, we could talk about this all day, but we'll do it on our own, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> over over a cup of coffee or something. Um, hopefully, as, uh, as soon as the pandemic uh, dies down and we can travel freely, meet each other freely, uh, I'm dying to see you guys and you know share stories that is long overdue. Uh, with that, I want to thank everyone who's participated at the 29th HMS Colloquium. We thank you so much for hanging in there for the past three and a half hours. But I really want to thank all our presenters, uh, some of whom we lost because of the time difference in Korea, they had to uh, go to bed. Um, but I want to also thank uh, Sean Dolan and Kim Estoke for uh, doing the whole logistics, uh, sticking by, checking if everything works or not. Uh, they've been absolutely instrumental uh, in organizing this talk today. Uh, we want to thank you once again and have a wonderful weekend.
Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone.